Hello everyone, welcome to another episode at the CEO Club. Today we have another exclusive, Zane Khan. He's travelled all the way from London to see us at the CEO Club. Zane, introduce yourself to our listeners. So first and foremost, uh, happy to be here. I've uh, been seeing the podcast for a while. It's been doing, uh, it's been doing great and uh, excited to be here. My name is Zane Khan. Um, I'm a CEO of a few different traditional businesses. Uh, also vice president of sales of a Network Martin project that we're currently a part of. And so, yeah, things are going really well and I'm uh, excited to be here. Thank you very much for introducing yourself. I'm looking forward to this podcast. Uh, I'm sure it will uh, get listeners interested. To start off with, with all my guests, I throw it right back to the beginning, talk about their childhood. So talk to me about your childhood. Were you always born and brought up in uh, London? Yeah, always uh, always in London. Um, born and bred. I kind of, you know, just most of my life I've spent in Northwest London. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been a... It's been a journey where everyone that's come through my life in London, um, I felt like has been a part of my whole family there. So I've always tried to kind of stay in, in London. Ever. No, no, no one in East London, no one in West. In just the heart of London, most of my family's been there. So it's been great. And what was life like growing up for you then? What kind of upbringing did you have? Yeah, just a normal uh, middle class upbringing. I, I was raised in a council estate. Um, you know, at the time, we never felt like we were struggling. Of course, you know, we saw the struggle, understood the struggle after. Uh, my mom worked in Asda for 20 years, so most of my life, she, was, you know, I remember that she was in uh, Asda in the bakery section, and uh, oh, sure. my dad was, uh, you know, went from job to job, couldn't really hold a job for a long time, and then became a chauffeur, and he's been doing that for I think about 10 years. Um, so yeah, that was basically our upbringing, and then went from a council house to now uh, to then a normal house um, over time. But yeah, normal middle class family growing up. When you say council house. Yeah, so it's owned by the council. Um, you kind of just pay a, a, a smaller, I think a smaller rent um, yeah. towards it and you get some, you get some assistance, um, but obviously not in the best areas. Yeah. Um, so I was brought up in an area where there was a lot of violence, a lot of... Uh, at the time, we, we just went out and, and, and played football. Um, we were very, very young to understand what kind of violence was going on, but then as you grow older into a young teenager, you understand that the surrounding wasn't the best. And so when you hear about stabbings and 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 this person stole from this household and you know there was a few issues like that where even our house got broken into a couple of times and so yeah it was it was difficult um but again it's just something that we adapted to because we didn't think it was something different outside of the space yeah you only know what you know Uh, do you feel like that experience growing up in a sort of council house uh with those kind of struggles shaped the person you are today or is that something that motivates you i've seen from your social media that you have got that motivational kind of uh, ambitious streak about you that you always wanted more from life. Yeah, definitely. I think when you're in that environment and you're... Well, I was playing a lot of football at the time. So the people that we were around, we had a, a little cage football outside of our council estate. So I felt like that was uh, the thing that took me away from all the, the violence and stuff. Because I could have caught... I could, there was two different crowds. There's the, cl- the crowd that played football. Yeah. And then there's a crowd next to the cage who wouldn't play football, would just roam around, <laughs> you know, smoke and stuff. So I was in that crowd that was playing football. So luckily for myself, um, sport was kind of the way to go, which kind of took me away from all the um, the craziness. But yeah, alhamdulillah for everything. Mashallah. I think, in, you know, when you think London and you think council estate, probably a lot of listeners might relate to this, is you just think top boy. Yeah. It's basically how it is. Exactly how it is. Exactly is, how is is that, that kind of vibe. Ex- is that an accurate portrayal of London and the the sort of council areas? Yes. The flats, or is it a lot of the areas, especially council estates, they're like that. You know, where you get a lot of, um, you know, it's very dull and there's nothing to do, and you know, you got kids that are, that are maybe playing sport. You you got kids that just you know get caught in the in the in the wrong environment. It's very easy. Because even though you might be playing sport, you still know the people that are not. You still know the people that are doing all the wrong things. So it's very easy to just be like, look, you know what? My mom's struggling. My dad's struggling. Forget playing football. Uh, let's just go and find out what these guys are doing because they, they're going to go and make some money or they're doing something that's, that even if it's illegal, maybe I've got protection. Um, you have the, all these thoughts in your mind and you obviously want to build a, a reputation for yourself yeah. in a sense. Um, grow some kind of ego and so for that you might need money or you might need to beat someone up and all of these situations come around in your mind and so at the time it, you got you got to have someone around you who's, who's wise enough and alhamdulillah I had, I had you know I had good parents you know who kind of you know were on top of us in a sense and made sure we was home at a certain time and you know with the right people 
so you've come to Bradford. Where, where from Bradford? This podcast is based in Bradford. You're from London. You travelled all the way up to Bradford. There's a lot of listeners that will probably be from up north that will be interested in the sort of London area. What would you say London is like in growing up in London? I think is like I said, everyone has different upbringings. Um, obviously, I only know London. So when I come to Bradford, you know, for me, it's like, you know, I would never live here. <laughs> That's what it feels like. It's, it's, it, the good thing is that there's no traffic, of course, yeah. but it just feels like, of course, they say London's too fast. But when you're brought up in that environment, when you're in that fast life, it's very difficult to then leave. I know some people, of course, transition from London to Midlands and yeah. higher up north. I know because of the, you know, the inflation or whether it's better cost of living, better value. Um, but I just felt like London was always like home. So yeah. for well, me, it was all about adapting. What is it about Bradford that makes you say, or up north in general, that makes you say that I would never live here? Like, uh, just throw some uh, out there. Nothing. Too slow? Yeah, nothing crazy. I just feel like, it's it's a bit like if you go to, if you go to the states. I've been to I've been to the states, right? Yeah. Uh, I've been to different different uh, states, right? Just you got New York, you got Atlanta. And whenever I've gone there, there's different states have different uh, environments. Yeah. So for example, London is a lot more rushy and busy, uh, and I feel like there's a lot more opportunity, uh, one to make money and one to know the right people. Uh, whereas in smaller areas, let's say for instance, might be Bradford, it might be Luton. Again, it feels like for me. Uh, from the outside is that there's less opportunity in those areas and so again you gotta know the right connections the right environments and so being in london i felt like for me was uh it, it, in a sense of course i grew up in a, in a council council state so it wasn't like i'm, I'm blessed with a, a great neighborhood yeah but i was i felt like around the right people to be in the right environment um and, and that's what it's come down to over time so it's not like i i dislike another city or anything yeah, like that yeah, it's, it's more home. about i just where home is home right home is home, is home. yeah so i think and people from up north would say that people from down exactly, south exactly. Uh, would say that would you say there's like a divide between up north and south or the the south and the north or perceptions around people judging think... people from up north versus judging people from down south because people from up north We'll always say, ah, oh, people from down south are stuck up, or, you know, that kind of general perception. And then people from down south will probably refer to people up north as, uh, well, you can tell us yeah, <laughs> what yeah, you refer yeah. to us yeah. as. Well, no, to be honest, I, I, I've, never really, I've never really looked at it like that. Yeah. I've always looked at it as, like, up north is cheaper. Yeah. It's, like I said, people out there, there's a lot more, um, you know, set communities. For example, Bradford, you know, they call it Bradistan yeah. in certain stages because there's a lot of Pakistanis that live here. In East London, there's a lot of Pakistanis also. So you yeah. might consider East London as the part of, you know, Asian community. And then you've got South Hall and part of West London, which is like Asian community. So people like to be where they feel they would feel best in their environment. So I believe being in a multi-diverse environment was something that I wanted. Okay. Um, over time, it's, it's always been the same. I've never felt like, okay, let, let's go up north because, you know, I want to live somewhere where there's more Asians, let's just yeah. say, or more better food restaurants. I know up north and Midlands are better for their food in comparison to London where, of course, the, there's not much uh, halal, for instance, halal restaurants. There's not much, uh, uh, you know, even restaurants that we have like Slam Burger, like we have in London. There's not many of that happening in London compared to the Midlands. Yeah. There's many like Slam Burger. That's probably why there isn't one in Bradford or one in Manchester because there's so many alike. Um, yeah, you know, those burger restaurants are really, really popping up over here. There's a lot, a lot more competition up north, yeah. definitely. You spoke about the price differences and the cost of living differences. Oh man, you can like I was staying in um, where was that? I think I was in Sheffield um, a few years ago, and there was a, a friend, a friend of mine's place. I was saying that he had a six bedroom and he paid two hundred and twenty thousand pounds. Yeah, and a six bedroom, right. like nice house, three floors. You probably couldn't even get an apartment with that, like a like a two bed apartment in London right now, two hundred twenty k. Yeah. So and that's not even like a luxury two bed apartment. That's like a standard, maybe less than standard, a two bed apartment you can get for two hundred twenty k. In so, a normal area as well. Like normal, normal nowhere even like a council estate. <laughs> really, a council yeah, estate area. Yeah, the London's uh, pricing is super high. And in terms of the income, then is a wage income slightly different then as well? Or? Of course, it differs, um, but still much less. I think I still think the minimum wage is just above. Uh, I think it's seventeen hundred, eighteen hundred after tax. So you're still gonna have that that ratio of people that, of course, 
still find it too expensive and this is why you get those people that transition from london to midlands london to up north because of course cost of living yeah um but at the same time i feel like if people uh, learn how to manage money and learn how to to focus on a certain kind of lifestyle then it won't become it won't be too difficult i agree with you there i was on the phone to one of my uh, clients a bit earlier um and he's uh, he's moved from i think he was central london or something but he's moved to crawley oh, and okay. he was saying yeah, it's yeah. not a nice stuff yeah. yeah he was saying he's moved to crawley he works in one of the airports around there and uh, he was saying yeah he's in he's paying i think 1800 pound a month rent for a one bed flat or two bed flat i don't know i can't remember uh but yeah he was saying yeah you're not he's not getting a lot of uh book for his money and i was just thinking up north you could probably get a uh, detached beautiful five bedroom house like you mentioned for a very similar price uh, so there is that difference there. That's really interesting to compare. So moving on from growing up in London, what was life like for you in your teenage years then? Did you go to uni? Or- so I st- obviously started off normal um, high school. I was, uh, after high school, I went into, well, in high school, funny enough, I actually started off playing football in high school properly. Um, and then, you know, I had some incident incidents which you know made me get kicked out of two different high schools. I had some some issues, um, you know, and, and that arose, and so I had to move from one high school to the other, and then one high school to the other. And it was the time around year nine. I think I was fourteen. I was in my house for about three months, no school, and my mom was like super stressed because the stuff I got kicked out for it was it was quite hard for a school to then take me. Um, you know, and then when when I actually did find a school, you can imagine it wasn't the best school because I had waited so long. It was literally a school saying, "Oh, you know what? This guy's done this and this and this. Got kicked out of two schools in two years. We'll take him." So you can imagine what kind of school that was. It's quite a rough school. Um, it was a rough school, and it was a, it was. A, but the good thing was it was a sports school. Okay. It was a sports college type school, and then um, there they had, of course, it was very similar to our council estate upbringing, where there's a lot of different. Uh, multi-diverse people but at the same time a lot of gangs a lot of you know uh, different um, situations that you can be in trouble straight away uh, and so I said to myself you know I don't want to disappoint my mom this time I want to make sure I stay in this school and just stay out of trouble and so luckily for myself I put myself in a position where I you know got around the right people tried to find out who's really not doing the things that they shouldn't um, and just kind of stuck with them so we had we had a group of about five of us and we kind of just ran through high school um and at the end of high school we we all got in, involved in the same kind of academy setup uh in football uh with uh Watford okay. um well football club and so around 16 years old we went to uh college together all five of us we carried on and then when out of 15 of us in the squad only two got professional contracts <laughs> So the rest of us got let go. And so we had a choice. And my mom said to me, if you don't go uni this year, it's going to be nine year, the nine K the year after. So I went in the year when it was three uh, K a year for uni. So if I didn't go uni that year, it would have been nine K. So I decided, look, I've done enough for football. I didn't make it, um, you know, for one reason or another, I need to focus on the education because I'm not going to make money playing football now. Yeah. Um, unless you play like non-league, which is of course always an uphill battle. And so I went into university, um, and university was, for me, was completely, it just felt Chinese to me, like, because I had not done proper A-levels, I had yeah. not done proper education. In our, in our football college course that we done, we done sports studies, yeah. so it was like a basic sports course. Okay. It wasn't even like sports science, so sports science you can go and do, um, you know, nutrition, you can do, you know, anatomy of the body. Sports studies was just so basic. It's like we just done it just because we can spend our time playing football. It wasn't that yeah. intense. And so university came along. Then, you know, I went, I'd actually done sports science in university, but it was so complex for me. I was finding it too tough. And I was just doing it for my parents' sake. You know, you know when your parents say, if you have a get a degree, um, you become a doctor or you're just disowned, basically. So yeah. um, my, my goal was to actually just get that degree and so my mom could just be like, you know, what? at least he's got a degree where he can land a job. So I done that. First year it went through, second year went through, and then in my third year is when I got approached for my first business venture. 
my, my final year, which is okay. vanilla marketing. You just said something that your mom wanted you to become a doctor. Is that the sort of expectations that your mom and dad had, like most Asian yeah. parents or? Yeah, yeah, most, most Asian parents will have that in their mind. But obviously my mom knew I wasn't gonna become a doctor yeah. because you know she she saw the traits yeah. um, of what I was like. I was, I was too sporty to go into that field. Um, so I, I, it was for me, it was just about trying to get a degree just so I can land a job. But, you know, when you actually look into it, most people, or 80% of people that get a degree don't get a job within the first six months. And the highest employers for people that get a degree is McDonald's. Second highest is Burger King. So I started reading up on, on these stats while I was actually at university. And I was trying to tell my mom, I said, look, man, these are the stats, you know. You know, I don't think I should get a degree. So I was trying to justify why yeah. I shouldn't get it. And she's like, nope, just get a degree. Just because, you know, when you want a job, you know, you have a degree. And I just wanted to do it for, for that favor. Um, but it was in my final year, I kind of said to myself, you know what, there's nothing that you're going to do that you're going to be good at if you don't want to do it. Nothing. If you want to do something, that's the best chance of you becoming good at it. And so because I didn't really want to go university, I didn't really want to study, I wasn't really going to be good at any, any point. So I was like, why do I waste my time here? Uh, you know, my final year even. Why do I? Why? Why should I waste my time here? I should focus on something that I might potentially be of interest with, and that way I can be good at it. And if I'm good at it, you know, I can be success successful. So that's when I got invited into network marketing. Okay, I think this is a good uh, point to uh, talk about the network marketing. So that's your first uh, business venture, network marketing. Yeah. Um, it's probably gonna have a lot of split opinions. We'll address it now on the podcast because I'm sure people will comment and be like, "What's network marketing? Yeah, yeah. This is a scam. This is an MLM. Is it a business opportunity? All the rest of it." So before we predict, everyone bombarding the comment section with their opinions, it'll be good to think forward and address everything now. So, just in terms of what is network marketing for people that don't know or people that. Ha maybe want a bit more information about it. Network marketing is basically a, a way of, you know, where you don't actually get, uh, you don't get any interviews, you don't get any placements, you don't get any wages. Um, you're base, you basically choose yourself to be a part of a company okay. on what products and services are provided and you're referred by someone. That's why it's called network marketing. So. Whatever service or product you're providing people with, if you have an interest in that and you feel like that's, you know, there's a gap in the market for it, then you're referred by someone because network marketing companies, they don't like to spend money on TV adverts, on on mass mails, on, on billboards. They'll rather use people because right. you know, people word of mouth is the most powerful. If I tell you right now, I said, go watch this movie, you're going to spend money on that movie, which means I'm providing you with a service or product through the movie, of course, it's not my movie. It's through a third party. It might be whoever it is view views charging you whatever, right? Twenty pound, whatever it is to go watch the movie. I've done that because I myself have watched the movie, yeah, and I like it. And I tell you about it. Now you go and watch the movie. Now, if you says to me, Zane, we're not going to put no adverts or trailers for this movie, but we're going to use you as a person that watches the movie. If you like it, go and share it with someone. Out of the twenty pound, when he when Asif when Asif buys his movie, out of the twenty pound, we'll give you two pound commission. Right. Because if it wasn't for you, Asif wouldn't know about it. He wouldn't have an interest, and you probably wouldn't watch an advert on TV. You probably wouldn't watch an advert on YouTube. When we say advert on YouTube, we skip the ad. Yeah. So these are the kind of modern ways that network marketing came with a again a gap in the market idea to use referral marketing to use word of mouth to provide a product or service. Um, where there's where they feel that people will have interest in. So okay. um, over time, when I first got started, the products are different to what now I'm doing. You know, even in the same field, but when I first started, the product and service was uh, gas and electricity. Right. So my 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 job was to to go and speak to my parents or my friends, um, or anyone that I, I knew, and I said, look, if you have gas and electricity, I can help you make it cheaper for a company. And that you know, if if it's cheaper good if not don't do it <laughs> yeah yeah i think so i remember that. there was quite a few companies that were doing it up uh, north as well i yeah. know is it acn yeah. is that yeah. did they do gas and electric and yeah. that kind of stuff i exactly. know there was a few people that were approached me regarding that years ago this years was ago years ago yeah. um so i kind of a vague understanding of it so your network marketing your referring is it an existing company's uh, products or are the is the network 
marketing company, the company that sells the products themselves? Some products are, you know, their own and okay. some products are third party. So right. they also have a partnership with a company. So they had a partnership with a company called First Utility. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of First Utility. First Utility, yeah. which, is, which is like a, you know, credible company. Uh, they're sponsors for many, many different sports, yeah. I think rugby, etc. So we we actually wanted to save people money by using Per State and because they were with ACN we had an extra discount because we had a partnership with them. So every time we referred it, you know, we got a higher sense of commission and that way ACN will get paid by a Per utility and then ACN will pay the representative. So it'll be like middlemans in between. Yeah. Uh, of awesome. course the in house services, they were obviously higher commissionable because they're actually the network marketing company service. Yeah. So the company service they had like products like health products. Um, you know, shampoos, that kind of stuff. And then they had like these adapters that helped you save uh, on, you know, international calls. Just normal, just, you know, for us, it was a thing where we had not known about how you can make money outside having a job. Yeah. We had not known that. So we're like, okay, as long as, long as this is legal, as long as we can do this and it's legal, why not? Because whenever someone said to me, oh, Zane, you know, but you might get scammed, this and that. I said to myself, okay, if one person has done this and it's worked, then it can't be a scam. Because you know they a scam can't be one good for one and not for the others. Does that make sense? For me, a scam has to be a scam for everyone. Okay. It can't work for one. It's, it's like going to the gym. Someone wants to go to the gym, they sign up to the gym. One person wants to lose weight, the other person wants to lose weight. They both go to the same gym. If one person doesn't lose weight and one person does lose weight, he can't say, oh no, the gym's a scam. They both have the same gym. How can one lose weight and one doesn't? Yeah. Everyone has different regimes and how they focus on it. And the, and the crazy thing is, the person that might even train the same, they might even have the same workouts. They might even go into the gym at the same time. They might even be training partners. Yeah. But still one might not lose weight and one might. Because the concept is not just about being in the gym. The concept is about what do you do outside the gym? Because that person that's going to the gym and losing weight, he might be sleeping better. He might be, he might have less stress levels. He, his diet might be on point. His sugar levels might be on point, right? All of those things are factors alongside losing weight, not just the gym. So that person might even be training the same, saying, oh, this gym's a scam. Well, in the end of the day, it's not just about the gym. It's what you do outside. So people that do network marketing, it's not just about what they do when they actually do the sales. It's what they do outside of the sales. So most most people know what they don't work on themselves. They don't try and personally develop. They don't read enough books, right? They get told this, but they don't do it. And so in the beginning stages, I was always told, and we was always told, um, ACM, for instance, was one of the best uh, personal development um, companies out there when it came to, and it's still running today. You know, any company has done thirty plus years in business. It's a very credible company. Yeah. You know, 95% of businesses don't last five years. So if they've done 30 years, they're already in the 5% bracket. So they were a very, very good teacher on personal development. They said, look, if you work on you, everything around you, business gets better. And so I think that's where the stigma comes in in the marketing. Wherever someone fails, they deem it to be, you know, not worthy for someone else. When at the end of the day, just because something hasn't worked for you, doesn't mean it's not worthy. It yeah. just means that it hasn't worked for you, and that's okay. You know, just like the gym might not work for you, just like university never worked for me, and I never call no university a scam. I never say, oh, you know, out of the people that get degrees, the majority of people actually end up with a debt that they can't recover with straight away or even after. There's many, many instances of forty percent of graduates they end up changing their course. So can you imagine someone who's doing a course, graduated, and then does another course because now they have an interest in it. 40% of people do that. Yeah. You might see in their first year they change courses or even in their final year they change into another course. So that again, we don't say, oh, university is a scam because people have more debt now because they've done two different courses. Well, no, we just go with the flow. So I think now Martin now, um, alhamdulillah, is now at a stage where a lot of people now believe in it. Okay. But... It's about what project and what company. Because again, many companies have come out that don't have the right intention. So they, they are they are actually a scam within the industry. Yep. But that's not the industry's fault. That's just you know, it's just people. You know, people can start a network marketing company with bad intentions, lure people in 
you can be in trouble. I think uh, that's one of the things that comes to mind instantly from somebody that hasn't had any affiliation with the market is people automatically stigmatize it and say it might be a Ponzi scheme or multi-level marketing kind of scam along those lines. Um, then there's documentaries that come out on Netflix. Like, I don't know if you watch the Herbalife one where they'll sell certain products, but really they'll make their money off other things on the side. So that makes sense um in in that area so the business opportunity itself is legitimate however there are probably organizations that have come in and maybe done the whole ponzi scheme and multi-level marketing whatever it is uh and and sort of made money like that and then that causes that sort of stigma which is probably why we're probably gonna get a hell of a lot of comments in in our in this podcast good, good. i'm sure there'll be people that have tried it maybe lost money not made money and uh, from my personal opinion i don't know enough about it to be able to Join say that it's, uh, it's it's the right opportunity or not and uh, people if they want to comment they're more than welcome to comment their own thoughts and experiences on it well and her, for instance herbal life you said herbal life, i think right? that's one of the ones that i watched on uh, i don't know if it is is it network marketing that or is it herbal life is network marketing and and the thing about and this is why it's very important to understand that people like to see things that that are tested yeah but they don't like to be the ones to test them. Okay. Right. They like things that are tested, but they don't like to be the ones to test them. So, for example, when you see something like Herbalife, yeah. Herbalife is another company, great company, billion dollar company. It's endorsed by people like Cristiano Ronaldo. It's endorsed by people like David Beckham. Yeah. When you see faces like that and they're endorsing them, they're using the products, they're on social media, they have contracts with the company. Now you think, maybe I should buy this product yeah. because these guys are doing it. These guys are pushing it. However... Cristiano Ronaldo and David Beckham can't control all the distributorship of the actual company. This is where distributors can also be doing things with the wrong mentality within the same company. Within the same, yeah. So you can manipulate things in network marketing to make it seem like you're running something which is legit but doing it illegitly. Yeah. And I've been in, like, even for example, uh, I've been in places where there's people that have literally registered a bunch of people on fake accounts. You know, so like putting random accounts in just to make commission and then, you know, never sold a real product, but just put there or let's say, let's say I'm a millionaire. I just put in a bunch of different accounts, buy all the products myself yeah. so I can make a higher sense of commission from buying the products myself and then refund all the orders okay. for myself so I can do bank, you know, chargebacks for my bank. There's many cases like that of people doing the wrong things in the right place. Yeah, uh, it's a bit like the the scenario we spoke about from my from my childhood. Yeah, you know, you got people that have made, you know, made it to the very top in in business and sport, who've come from the roughest places. So there can be right things done in bad places, and there can be wrong things done in good places. Yeah, and it's just uh, different characters. The monthly fees that a, f a few people mention is where you have to pay monthly fees. Yeah. So do you wanna? It'll probably come up in conversation again. So do you wanna? elaborate on why people have to pay joining fees pay monthly fees and how that Perfect. whole business model works and it operates so let's let's use an example now as if if i wanted to get you to buy a product or service okay and i said this costs two thousand pounds you'd find that a lot more risky in comparison to me to tell you hey listen instead of two thousand pound how about you pay a hundred dollars a month yeah and that hundred dollars a month that you pay you'll get the same access as though if you would pay two thousand pound however at any time you can stop there's no contract there's no lifetime agreement there's no uh, bank charges that you'll face if you cancel early nothing cancel 24 hours before your auto ship is due and that is it so that makes people understand that they don't have to be involved in a project by paying a bin lump sum um, they can get involved and pay monthly yeah and they have it very risk-free because at any month they feel that it's not of value for them just like a gym you know they have to feel value you got people that pay for the gym and don't go yeah so people do have money to pay for things that are not they're not using however in network marketing people feel like just because they've joined they deserve an income but it's it not it's like not that. a job it's not even university for instance you only get paid after you graduate and if you land a job in the field that you graduate in you don't get paid during your university. So it's about, you know, sharpening the X and, you know, cutting the tree later. So that's how network marketing is for me. I think it's once you develop yourself into a certain stage, 
so you know more than um, if you look at for instance female females 50 percent of female millionaires come from little martin i didn't know that really yeah little martin's a massive fifteen thousand new millionaires in little martin in the uk or worldwide worldwide 15 15 000 new millionaires are created in little martin every single year okay yeah. and that money that you pay every month then just to try and get an understanding of it for from uh from an outside point of view what does that money what are you paying for for instance for right now within our company someone will pay for uh, a trading software okay where they'll get analysis and help on what trades to go into when it comes to forex for instance um specifically and they would actually get help and analysis for those trades to, that they actually embed those trades into their own trading platform they'll have they'll control their own equity yeah. Um, everything will be under their control their their money the only thing they pay for is the the company's service which is the whatever is hundred dollars or whatever is two hundred dollars per month they would actually pay for the service so they can get access to these uh trading and education brilliant uh, okay that makes sense and uh, in terms of uh, the networking events what is that all about because I'm sure listeners have seen the the hype, the yeah. motivation, the the dancing at the end, or whatever else. <laughs> I've seen a few clips, and it always intrigues me. Uh, I've never been to one myself, but just what is that about? Then is that just channeling sort of positive energy, or what, what is that all about? A little bit of everything, really. Obviously, you got the education, where there's people that have experience in network marketing that teach people on sales, teach people how to actually present the op the opportunity to people. And of course, train people on the products and services. And then you got, of course, the aspect that if you got new people that want to hear about the business, you want to bring them to an environment where they would feel like there's actually something real happening. Because in network marketing, you ha you create the environment. The environment is not given to you. Like there's no massive office or building where you can go. There's no Wall Street yeah. where you can actually see a bunch of different stockbrokers. Everyone is independent business owners in network marketing. So they would have to create that whole environment for them. So in that scenario, we use events to actually help people understand what it is we do and show the realism. Of course, some people might say, oh, you know, I've had someone say to me one time, well, everyone that's here, we've got 2,000 people here, but everyone that's here is a paid actor. <laughs> okay, well. I've had that one too. So, you know, I was thinking to myself, do you know how much it will cost for us to pay, to pay yeah. all of these guys to be here just to get you involved? Like that would be a very, very uh, <laughs> difficult thing for our company to fund just for you. I yeah. said that sarcastically, of course, um, yeah. which of course might be patronizing to him, but it was really just about me sharing with him the fact that network marketing doesn't need anyone. We need network marketing because in the end of the day, network marketing is already a multi-billion dollar industry. You know, it's bigger than the NFL. You know, how big the NFL is, you got Super Bowl. It's bigger than the gaming industry. You know, you got things like FIFA, you got things like uh, 2K, you know, all of these games, Grand Theft Auto, Fortnite, Call of Duty, it's bigger than the gaming industry. So the fact that you have this industry there means that people are getting paid. Because all of the other industries like NFL, like gaming, or like music, there's people getting paid. And so if they can get paid and we're bigger than them, there's, there's, there's a big pie out there for us. So is that equal opportunities for everyone to get paid because i'm um, probably assuming people will probably assume that you're quite high up you're yeah. successful that's one of the reasons we've got you on here mashallah you're doing really really well you're definitely up there you, what would you say to people that might turn around and say you're doing really well you're sort of uh, at the level where you're making it but to have a person like you there has to be a thousand losers i've heard that a lot as yeah. well but there's one winner and there's a thousand losers what would your response be to that I would say, where can you go right now where there's only winners? Nowhere. All right. So I would tell them also to look on my Instagram. If you go back to 2013, I put a post up on my Instagram and it, and it, and it showed something like uh, about to start something new. Pray for me. Yeah. And that was, that was my first meeting in El Markton. <laughs> I oh, put yeah. the picture up and I just put the pray hands on the caption. And that's, that was when I first signed up, when I paid. It was like £400 to start. And I was 19 years old. I was like paying £400, 19 years old. Back then, it was like a lot of money for me. Um, but I realized that I was about to start something that I can potentially really enjoy and I can be good at. So there's always going to be winners and losers in everything. It's, if it's competitive enough, there has to be losers. Otherwise, it's not competitive. Um, and so 
everyone starts at the bottom. Everyone. So where I am, where I am today, I started where anyone else would start. So there is equality. There's no, um, hey, you'll start here because you look good or you dress good or you speak well. You know, if I if this was me at 19 right now speaking to you, I wouldn't know what to say. Yeah. So it's the experience that comes with, and then you know, hopefully later on you you won't start from the top. Even if I was to start a new company today, even though I will start where I start, I will start with experience. So I won't be starting from the bottom because I have experience. So it's like anything. It's like a footballer. You know, it goes from one club to the other. It doesn't start from the bottom because he's played football in a different place, but doing the same thing. It's all about levels in the end of the day. Speaking about that, I think I saw a video on your Instagram. It was you with your little snap cap on, uh, looking all cool in your earlier days. I think were you jumping into an Astro or something? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an old school throwback yeah. when I was just looking at your videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that around the same time? Yeah. Was it around that kind of uh, Yeah, so that, that was literally when I, when, I, when I pulled up in a Mercedes after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, so that was what? my, that was literally, because look, sometimes you have internal motivation. So my internal motivations were, of course, you know, I want to get a new car. You know, because my, my Astro was something that I didn't feel I can inspire people with. Yeah. You know, and I, if I'm talking about a business that's massive, I don't want to be driving an Astro. And so, extrinsically, you have a different kind of motivation where there was a lot of people saying, bro, Zane, you ain't making money. Like, you're saying you're at this rank or at this stage, but you ain't making money. So, I, I made that video strictly for the haters. Okay, wow. Well. Strictly. Because I said to myself, if these guys are going to doubt me, you, you can buy a fake watch. You can't buy a fake car. Yeah. I can't have a fake Mercedes. So I had to make sure I get that car as my first car just to let people know I was making money. You know, it might sound like, oh, why would you do that just for other people? Yeah, but yeah. at the end of the day, because you're in network marketing, there's a whole stigma around people that don't believe what you believe. And so in network marketing, it's very important that people understand that it's real. So I wasn't doing it just for the sake of like, oh, okay so he's really doing it now and i can get the applaud no i was doing it so people actually believe that okay you know what zane is making money i was wrong let me try and see and so hopefully that video was uh you know kind of like a kick in the backside yeah. because some people believe just by seeing like i i saw the presentation i was like man i can do this but some people don't believe that and some people most people are skeptical they're like oh no nah, nah. it's bs you know yeah so they need to is, see. They need sometimes people get inspired by material. By material things, yeah, it's true. And then you, you you'll always have people looking from different perspectives and different sets of eyes. Uh, you'll have somebody looking and they'll see it and they'll be inspirational, and other yeah. people with a little bit of envy and and sort of jealousy towards you or feeling like that should be them in that situation. Uh, it's always their own situation and their own set of eyes that they're looking at you through, exactly. uh, which which you can't control. So, uh, final question regarding that is yeah. uh, for anyone that is gonna comment and, and say, nah, I lost money or it's a scam or whatever else, what would your response be to them now before they comment? Um, look, what, in network marketing, no one has a gun to no one's head. You know, no one's holding no one ransom. I would always say, whenever you're getting introduced to something, forget network marketing, introduced to anything, just do your own due diligence. You know, do your own research. That way, you can't say one, you know, one year down the line, one month down the line, one day down the line. Hey, listen, as if you brought me into something, and you know, you gotta take some accountability. If you're over the age of eighteen, and you have to be to join network marketing, if you're an adult, you shouldn't be, you know, you're not gonna be forced in network marketing anyways. But you shouldn't really act as a victim to network marketing because you're a grown person. For you to say later on, or oh, I've been scammed, means that you yourself scammed yourself because in the end of the day if i'm going to go into marriage and then i have a divorce six months later because i got married on the basis of someone else telling me about marriage then of course that divorce later on will be based on me, me saying hey listen you told me to get married no marriage is done based on you yourself doing the research into your spouse into understanding where you are in life you know you're not just gonna turn up one day and be like i'm getting married today yeah so a marriage is a commitment. Business is a commitment. Network marketing is a business. So network marketing is a commitment. So at the end of the day, I always say, whenever it comes to commitments, do some kind of research. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be long. You know, you research something for one week, you'll learn enough to say yes or no. You know, one week. Yeah, one week's not a long time. So yeah, I definitely feel like um, if someone wants to come to me right now and say, look, you know, I've lost this or I'm going to lose that, I'd all say, hey, listen, 
You know, I'm at a stage in my life right now, or even now, whether it's now or whether it's back in the days, I've never ever told someone, hey, listen, you have to do this. Yeah. You know, I say, look, if you want to do this, do it. If you don't, don't. You know, I know what's happened for me, so it can happen for you kind of thing. Yeah, you know, that's uh, that's good advice to people. Whatever business opportunity they get into, it's always uh, important to do your due diligence and uh, do your research properly before you get into the uh, the industry, whatever industry that may be. And uh, in terms of rank ups as well, uh, probably people will question in it. But what does that mean when you post pictures and you you'll say like chairman or or like a rank up or I think on a, a post you posted recently. You said somebody's got a rank up to a certain position. Is that just levels within the business? Yeah, it's just ranks within the business. A bit like, you know, just like a, a normal job. You have, you know, employees, supervisor, manager, regional manager, you know, um, chairman, yeah. CEO. So you got ranks within jobs. You got ranks within business as well. In network marketing, the ranks based upon what, what you bring into the business. Okay. So in terms of sales in terms of volume, in terms of uh, products and services being distributed through your organization. Everything's built on a network, just like uh, Instagram or Facebook. Everything's built on a network. For example, you've got people that are verified on Instagram. Now you can pay for it, but normally verification yeah. will require some kind of, you know, you might you have to be someone with a network. You know, otherwise, why would you be verified? Yeah, You have to have some kind of audience. So with network marketing, it's the same thing. As you build a distribution, as you have some kind of leverage towards your business, as you're bringing the company some success, the company will give you these ranks, and those ranks will enable you to earn on a higher bracket. Right. So whereas sense. someone will be from 10 to 20K a year or 20 to 40K a year, the yeah. higher the ranks, the bigger the brackets become. Right, okay. And what rank are you then? Now I'm not actually a rank within my current company. I've gone into a more corporate role within okay. my company, so I'm now um, a vice president of sales in the UK for the company I'm with. Right, okay. So that's not a rank, that's just more of a, a, a different position within the yeah. the company. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, the last question regarding this is, you see, I've got a suit business now, I sell bespoke suits, and I want to somehow increase my sales. I'm thinking of my own cap now, and I, there's network marketing uh, agencies and companies like yourself. How would a company be able to get their services and their products to a network uh, agency like that, what would be the process um, for you guys to sell our suits or give us clients? Or does it not work like that? Uh, again, it's you're already doing a network marketing business within the business because you said right now you've got so many uh, sales. Yeah. Like, listen, up. Yeah, I'll it's all that. done through word of mouth. Word of mouth, and it's the same thing in network marketing. And this is how easily network marketing businesses can run. For example, as if let's just say hypothetically, you have these great suits. suits yeah. You know, you sell them for 500 pounds. Let's say the suit price is 250 pounds, but you double up and yeah. you, the, the, the margin is 250 pounds right. and the cost is 250 pounds. So you make 250 pounds. Let's say, for instance, you don't have the network that you want to have in London, for instance. And I take this, you know, idea that, you know what? I don't have the product. You have the product. I take that, um, you know, that suit collaboration with yourself and I go to London and I go and sell those suits and I say I said all you gotta do you gotta provide the suits you know the supply I don't know anyone yeah. anyone that wants to buy a suit for 500 pounds out of 250 pound margin spread that you're gonna get just give me 50 pound okay. you're gonna get 200 pound that you wouldn't have got Normally. because I have the network I have that person in London Yeah. you're still gonna be selling your suits in Bradford you're still gonna be selling your suits in clientele but now I've made 50 pound from using your product mm -hmm. I have got no supplier I have got no rent to pay no costs the only thing I get paid for is when I make the sale. And I don't get paid. I don't actually pay for speaking. Yeah. <laughs> that's the only thing I'm paying for. Uh, sorry, that's the only thing I'm doing to get paid, speaking. I just have to use the suits. I can even market the suits for free. I'll put it on my social media, put it on channels, take it to places like uh, who, with people, friends that wear suits, show them. That's it. So that now makes I've made much more sense. Yeah, that yeah. makes much more sense when you put into a practical example like that. Mm -hmm. And I, as a business owner, would benefit because I'm just getting extra leads and sales uh, coming through where I normally wouldn't get them from. Yep. And you guys are just networking, getting these sales in, and getting a commission for the sales. You get ten people doing that; they're all getting, you know, fifty pound each. You're getting an extra two thousand pound. 
and that's how you build the home here that's interesting i have to look into that <laughs> we'll have to have a, have a chat off camera okay that makes sense and hopefully for the listeners that makes a little bit more sense yeah uh now that we've put it into a practical example as well so if we're selling a thousand suits a month uh, in london thanks to zane <laughs> we'll give him a thanks now uh okay so that makes sense uh, so that'll so- be 50 50k to me right <laughs> yeah that sounds good we can negotiate uh so you're 19 uh you get did you say 19 when you got into network marketing so you're 19 you get into network marketing talk to me about some of the challenges struggles what's your journey like then how do you go about it yeah so at 19 i was in my final year of uni and a, a girl from facebook i didn't really know her personally but she she went to my high school so you know when you're just friends on facebook yeah. but you don't really speak so she messaged me, so I was like, what's this? You know, and then she's on the message, she said to me, hey, if you want to make extra money, come to this meeting, all legal. That's all she said. And then I messaged her back. I said, what is it about? She said, the meeting will discuss everything that it's about. It's all to do with uh, telecommunications and gas and electricity. So I was like, you know, it might just be like sales work, etc. So I'll just go and see. And I drove, I remember, I drove all the way to South London at the time. And I just got started. Uh, in ter- just, just by looking at the presentation, I felt like there was some, this was something that I probably could do. Because yeah. um, I was already doing personal training in the gym at the time. While I was in university, I was actually doing personal training in the gym. So I was already kind of self-employed. So while I was doing that and I got involved in network marketing, I said to myself, what are the major challenges I'll have? The major challenges I'll have is time. Because I wanted to dedicate some time to network marketing, but I was studying um, university on a full-time degree. I was in personal training where I had quite a lot of clients daily. And then at the same time, I was also um, playing non-league football, just like uh, two days a week. So it wasn't like uh, professional or semi-professional football. Semi-professional football is not as serious. You do get a little bit of money here and there, but it's not as serious. So one day training, one day game. So it wasn't, it, that would take about f- six hours a week, most of the time. So I was like, you know what? I'm doing quite a lot of things right now. Do I need to be doing it on marketing? So I said to myself, what the challenges are? And I weighed the pros and cons. And when I weighed the pros and cons, I said to myself, you know, I'm 19 right now. Maybe doing what I'm doing right now is okay. And it was a, actually a conversation I had with someone. And I asked the person... I said, I'm doing this and this and right now. Maybe I'm doing all the right things. Do you think I should stay here and wait and graduate? And after all of this is behind me, maybe I can go into network marketing. He said to me, Zane, doing what you're doing right now is fine. But let me ask you a question. Would you want to be doing what you're doing right now after five years? And then I said to myself, okay, 24 years old, doing this. Mm, Maybe not. Maybe yes. Who knows? Then he said to me, would you like what you're doing after 10 years? I said, no, no way after 10 years. He said, so you're going to have to change something at some point anyways. So why not do it now? And that's what got me. I said to myself, if he, if he said that, you can change it right now, change it right now. Because by the time you get to those 24, 25, you can adapt, you can change, you can, you're going to have experience. So I got involved in the hunch that maybe this is something I can be good at right now. And I don't want to miss out on the timing of it. And it was the hardest thing was probably to tell my parents that, look, I'm stopping uni. But I done it in a way where, look, I said, look, I'm what I'm doing right now, I have a passion for it, and I promise you, you know, I'm going to win. So that was another internal motivation for me. In the first six months, I was able to give my mom and dad, you know, like 5,000 pounds, that cash. I was like, here's 5,000, here's 5,000. Just so they can understand what I'm doing is real, you know, in a sense. Um, and after that, there was, <laughs> there was, there was, there was, they knew it was real. You know, yeah. before when you go to my house, they'll be like, Zane is doing something that's completely dodgy. <laughs> Don't speak to him about anything. Yeah. And then after about after about five months, when I gave him the money, then when you went to the house, they'll be like, have you seen what my son is doing? Yeah. Let me tell you what, what he's doing. They'll take out a pen, they'll pay, a paper, let me show you what he's doing. And they'll so, be doing the network. Yeah, working. exactly. They'll be doing the drawing the circles <laughs> out. So I said to myself, if this is something that I can be good at, all I have to do is give myself one year, one year at a time. So every year... Uh, I'll design a goal for myself for one year. And if I get closer to that goal, or I feel like I'm, if I'm moving towards the right value, then I'll carry on. So every year I'll do that every year. And I just, I just never had a year where I said, oh, no, this year I'll stop. I just never had that time. So I'm that all the way through till now. I feel like there's always, uh, there's a space for me 
um, in this space um, to keep on delivering. Mashallah. What would you say? The question that comes to my mind is: What is the difference between a self-employed salesman versus a network marketer? Like, what is the difference? Uh, network marketing doesn't require only sales. Okay. So network marketing, you can actually make money now by using the products and services. For example, if you're in network marketing right now, you don't have to sell to make money. So right now I'm using the products and services. I can make money from the Forex. I can make money from the service. Okay. I don't have to be doing sales. But back in the days when I started, sales was the only way you made money. Yeah. To help someone else get started was to make money. And so that's where the the stigma came in because people thought like, oh the agenda is to just recruit others um yeah. you know and that's where you make the money well essentially when you're recruiting others they're also getting value for the service because in the, end of the day they're getting cheaper gas electricity right because when they become a customer they're all also part of your business so they're able to then sponsor others so they don't have to sponsor others they can just literally get saving or use the products and services and just sit there and, yeah. and the people that do want to refer they do it because they can get what commissions yeah for example you don't have to be giving me your suit business you know for me to refer it. you can make money yourself just by selling suit business but if you do want me to refer it you can make extra money, extra money yeah. without what no cost so i don't have no cost to refer this business to someone else yeah. same way why you would do it is the same way why network marketing people do it it's mutually doesn't beneficial. cost exactly win-win yeah that makes sense no one actually loses they just complain because they want a reason to not do it <laughs> yeah people always look for a reason sale. right yeah. so like, oh they're these guys are just recruiting well, yeah the whole world recruits you know you've I been think recru- that's the, the the recruitment stigma is yeah. uh, it so i've got a recruitment agency as well where we find uh candidates for companies like an actual recruitment agency and i think the stigma uh is um for for mlms is uh the only way you earn money is by recruiting others and and sort of so on and so forth like that so i think that stigma probably is the thing that people or that don't really know much about it now that you've explained it it makes a lot more sense and why it would be mutually beneficial for all parties totally makes sense uh, if i had a guy network marketer selling my suits and i'd happily give him well I, well I do already i've got people that will send me a referral i'll give them a little commission and they'll uh, they'll give me that client. So in a way, we're already doing it just yeah. subconsciously. You just didn't have a name for it. <laughs> yeah, there's no official name for it. Yeah, uh, I'll tell that to the people that send uh, send me clients across. Um, so you mentioned you gave your mom and your dad five thousand uh, pound at the beginning six months. In terms of figures, then what kind of figures are you looking at? How much can you make? Is it completely subjective or? Yeah, it is subjective based on it's like a waiter. A waiter won't get paid much by the hour. They'll get paid on performance. Yeah. So the better the performance of the waiter would depend on the service. So everyone's service is different. Everyone's performance levels are different. So, you know, in my first year, I, I got close to six figures in my first year. Um, you know, I just, just missed it. But I never even had a target for that much. For me, the goal was just to make an extra £2,000 a month. That was it. I was like, if I can do personal training, because remember... As if we don't have to be doing one or the other. Okay. It can be all together. Yep. You know, you can be doing personal training, you can be studying, and you can do, be doing network marketing. Network marketing is not even a, a full-time thing. You know, yeah. you can be doing it part-time, spare time, whatever. So I said to myself, okay, if I just focus on this and I can make an extra £2,500 a week maybe, that would be amazing. But then things started to escalate, and I started, you know, we started to grow as, as a distribution. We started to grow in sales. And then as the numbers became, you know, unmanageable for myself to still be personal training is when I left. You know, after like, I think it's about six, seven months, I said to myself, maybe I should call it a day with personal training and just kind of go all in with the, with the note marks and stuff. And then when did you then go into other business ventures then? So you're in your 20s now. Mm. You've said you've made six figures uh, in your first year. Mashallah, that's amazing. How did that feel like to make six figures, by the way? Was it your first ever close to six figures? Yeah, first ever, you know, first ever money that that was like meaningful money. Yeah. Um, at the time, of course, didn't even know where it went. You know, spending everything, doing nonsense. Like what? Um, designer wear, lifestyle. Designer wear. I was can... traveling. I was, you know, spending more money than I need to spend. I didn't know. I didn't know about money management. Yeah. No one told me that that I might not make this money next year. You know, yeah. kind of just. Yeah, just kind of just going with the flow, and you know, when when you know, spent like 
I was like that Mercedes. It was like twenty k. So I was like, I, I was spending everything. And I said to myself, it's gonna be only bigger the next year. Alhamdulillah, it was, but it was stupid of me. And so the next year, I, I decided um, I was gonna fix up. And so that's when I started to understand man money management, started to learn about it. And this is why mentors are important. Who do you say your mentor is then? Have you got at the time um, a good friend of mine who was in the same project? Um, he kind of started with us. He was he joined um, the company around six months before I joined. Right, okay. Um, luckily, he was actually a regional manager for uh, Marks and Spencers. No oh, way. Right. So because he was a regional manager there, he already had the kind of boss-like qualities. Um, authoritative guy, but he's still young. He was 20, like mid-20s, late, maybe mid-late 20s when I, when I started. So he was, you know, mature guy, but still young. Um, and he was kind of sh- learning along the way. And whenever he would speak, I would be like, oh, this guy's like the guy to this. And he was one of the higher ranks as well. And so when he was telling me, you know, do this with your money, do this, you know, spend this, spend that, work on this, focus here, uh, put this aside, you know, tax this. And, you know, I, I started to learn as that went on. So he was, he was kind of the, my first three years of that specific company while I worked with him. He was the first guy to, to help me with all of those things. And I, you know, thank him. To, me, me, me and him are still friends today. I think I have the a guy that I followed. He's probably similar to yourself. Is it Alex? Alex uh, Morton or something? Alex like Morton's a great, great friend um, as well. I've he's, seen his videos pop up and he's quite a motivational speaker. Yeah, he is. He he's he's, he's in the recent company I was a part of before I joined this project. Okay. But yeah, he, he, was, he, was, uh, he was a vice president of that company. Um, the one that, the yeah. one I was a part of uh, previously. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, I've just uh, seen yeah, a few guy. of his videos pop up, and it's quite motivational. Please. I think he spoke at Grant Cardone's uh, event or something. Yeah, I him saw, and Grant are friends. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw a few videos. We had Grant at our event too. Does, does, does it yeah. come? No way. What do you think of Grant Cardone? Yeah, he's, he's a, a character, isn't he? Mercurial guy. Yeah, he's a cool guy. Very. It, this is why it's so important of who you listen to. Okay. Because if you have someone like Grant Cardone. And then you have someone like Gary V, for instance. Gary V will tell you, uh, don't chase money, chase happiness. Yeah. You know, he'll tell you, downgrade your lifestyle. If things are not working for you, you're living too lush. You know, downgrade. When you go to Grant Cardone's page, you'll be like, Man, get more money, you'll <laughs> be more happy. You know, 10x, 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 you know, and he'll say, you know, stop buying designer, buy real estate. Yeah. You know, and if you, if you wanna, if you wanna uh, get yourself into a position where you're happy, just stack more money. And you know, so it's, they're both kind of contradicting. That's why it's so important listening to the right people. You can't have, you know, for you to have Grant Cardone and Gary Vee as a mentor, you can't be serious yeah. about what it is you're about to do because you're going to be contradicting your own mind on what is right. So always have a mentor in a space where you feel like your alignment is in terms of blueprint, in terms of strategy. For example, we look at even Islam, for instance. In Islam, people look at the prophets because that's the kind of alignment they want, you know, in terms of how the how the Sahabas, how the prophets live. That's why when you speak to them about things that don't align with that, they're going to be confused. They're like, no, this is not the way, you know. And so, you know, I sit with brothers sometimes in my car and they don't listen to music. So if I start putting on music, it's not going to align with what they want. And so they'll tell me, hey, bro, you know, do you mind if you don't play, don't play music today? Yeah. So that's why it's so important to listen to the right things because, again, it's all tied into what you want to do, your, what your purpose is. And in terms of your alignment, then, you've got Grand Cardone, you've got Gary Vee. Where does your alignment fit with that? I, pff, to be honest, I don't really watch... I, I watch them, but none of them are like my, my mentors. Kind okay. of thing. You know, I, don't really, I don't really focus too much on... Um, you know, because Grant, Grant Cardone is more like the materials guy. Money He's got guy. some great stuff, you know, yeah. a, a very good stuff about investments and stuff. And then you got Gary Vee, who's like, you know, he's the humble type, you know, he's very good to have, of course. You know, he's, you know, if, if things are not going for your way, just make sure you understand that you're blessed just because, you know, you're awake today. Things like that, you know. I would definitely say, though, um, for me, uh, my mentor has always been... Um, someone who I'm inspiring to be if I was in their position at their stage. So, for example, if there's someone at 20... When I was 25, there was someone who's 30. If I would feel like I want to be like that person by the time I'm 30, I would use them as a mentor. So it doesn't have to be even someone that you're speaking to on a regular basis. A mentor is someone 
that can be your mentor indirectly. Some people have mentors through books. Some people have mentors through audios. Some people have prophets as as a mentor, even though they would never have access. Yeah. So the reason why that is is because, again, they see themselves into becoming the best version of themselves, but as close as they can to that person. So at the end of the day, that's, that's what I've always strived for. I've always said to myself, you know, after five years, I want to be like that person. I've kind of kept it private within myself yeah. to, to know who the person is and know who I want to be. So by the time I'm, I'm 30, 35, 40, et cetera, and so. Yeah, yeah closer to them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I tend to just cherry pick bits of information that I like from, from each of them. Great. And um, one of the things that confuses me about Grand Cardone uh, is the, the don't buy a house or rent it. I think it's flexibility, I understand. Have you heard that message quite a bit? Everyone seems to put this message out, don't buy a house, rent it. Well, it's good, even on an Islamic perspective. You know, you don't get the, the interest stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I felt like when he said that, I think he was talking on a basis of never live in a liability. Okay. So the, the house that you own and you live in it, it's a liability, just like a car. Right. A car that you buy that you then rent out is not a liability. It's an asset because it pr- produces an income. So if you rent where you are and you have a, bought another property, for example, you can use that money for assets so you can actually provide yourself an income that will pay for your rent where you live. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's Until that mean. house is then uh, paid for and then you move on to the next property. And that's, how, that's, that's, that's been his strategy over time. But I feel like with the real estate, again, you got, you got to have education. You gotta have education and you gotta have location. It throws me off. I always think I understand that a house that you live in is a liability, but then renting a house is also a liability. That's the thing that confuses yeah, me. Yeah, renting is also a liability, but renting's it's not gonna be a lump sum cost. Yeah. You know, a lump sum cost is always a heavy hit because you can use the lump sum to invest in assets. Yeah. You can't use rental income to invest. In assets. Rental income would be small. Um, to invest you can't put away two thousand pound in a month and be like you know i'm going to invest into these this stock or these uh crypto for instance or this real estate you know i would have to invest based upon having a lump sum that's why i think he says that yeah that's a good one for listeners listeners can comment down below Uh, i'll put this into a little tiktok and see what their thoughts are on buying a house living in it liabilities or renting the house uh, and all the rest of it um so once you've uh, achieved success in network marketing, what are you doing with the money then? Are you investing into assets? Are you? Uh, I know you've got a few franchises that I wanted to touch upon as well. Yeah. So yeah, I start. I tried to put the money into different places. You know, some of course uh, in the beginning stages was trying to put it into real estate. Um, you know, getting a few real estate places places back home. Um, recently in in the UAE. When I first started up north as well. Um, and so after real estate, I said I wanted to get something that's a bit more volatile. Went into crypto investments in those those areas, um, and then yeah, d- whatever kind of tickles my fancy in a sense. You know, I watches even um, whatever I feel like is something that I have an interest in, I will invest. And you know, and, and then you know, inshallah, it goes the way you want it to go. Not always as it has. Um, you know, there's 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 actually been many many occasions where I've lost a lot of money but i understood that it wasn't the uh the investments fault or the person who told me about the investment or the actual research or anything else it's just that in investments not every investment can be a win yeah but the important thing is to understand is that investments always a numbers game and the more you do the more you'll learn on what to invest in and what not for example if i was to invest in a traditional business right now after investing in my first one i would know what things to do what kind of location to get what what i think will be better for the for the profit margins based on what i've seen in, in is for example the food market what i've seen is the the high stock margins that have been you know more and more inflation has made them go into higher prices so the margins have gone less so some of the things like that you kind of have to do it and then learn about it later on that's the kind of thing about investment but some people they invest and they bank their next investment based on how their first investment has gone. Yeah. So if their first investment's gone great, let's invest again. But that's not how investment works. Investments should always be separated in the mind. If you invest in one subject, doesn't mean the other subject can win or lose. It just means that there's two different subjects out there. 
Some might, some will win, some will lose, but you have to have an interest in it. That's why it's going to do well. That makes sense. And what made you get into the food business then? Was that an interest that you've always had? No, not always. It's just at the time I was interested in diversifying my portfolio because I said to myself, I've already, I've already invested in like um, tech. I've already invested in, uh, you know, decentralized projects in online businesses, in real estate. Maybe I should have something tangible, something that will produce cash flow that's tangible, that's operating on a 24 hour basis. Not a 24 hour basis, but like ongoing daily basis, yeah. you know, rentals for instance, even in houses might be vacant some months. So with a business every day, there's, there's some kind of volatility. So I actually went to Luton, I was in my auntie's house and in my auntie's house, she said that, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a new burger shop called Slam Burger. They do cheeseburgers and everything. I was like, oh, I have a cheeseburger. <laughs> So we ordered a cheeseburger from Uber Eats and I ate the cheeseburger and I swear it tasted just like the McD's one. Obviously back in the days when, you know, when I would eat the McD's one, yeah. I didn't really know about the halal haram stuff. Yeah. But obviously there were 99p at the time. So we just, after school, we just, just, just munch it. And um, I was like, oh, Slam Burger's one is like the McD's one. Like it's got the gherkin, it's got the ketchup, it's got the meat, it's got good quality bread. What is this uh, Slam Burger? And I, I remember I checked the menu and they had so much stuff, like so many, like Smash, they had Whoppers, they had like a Burger King style, they had the McDonald's style, they had the, the KFC style. So they had different, different restaurants that they were kind of, you know, make into their own and then, you know, sell it and it was all halal. So that was like, you know, I looked on the website and they had a franchise cost, I think it was like 25, 30K for the franchise fee. And then, um, so I wanted to get in touch with the owners. The flagship was in Birmingham. So I went and went to the Birmingham, went to see the, the business, you know, saw the numbers, what they were doing and got in touch with the owners. Uh, the owners, great guys too, Algerian brothers. Um, so yeah, it had, it had good, strong morals behind it. The word slam burger, slam basically stands for S L A M basically stands for the two owners daughters. Okay. One Sienna, one's Liana, and so S L A M, and then Burger. So I, was, I just thought it was called Slam Burger, but there's actually a meaning behind it. Um, but yeah, it was a nice little touch, and all of those little things kind of added up to making me feel like maybe this is the the easier. Because I didn't want to start a business just from without any kind of experience in the food industry for my own brand. Yeah. Because I'd be like, you know, I I haven't done this before, so it would have been easier to use a known brand which is like Slam Burger was quite known. It was very big in East London, in Walthamstow, um, and they were very busy in Birmingham. So I was like, you know what? If I bought it to like Northwest London, it will, it will be in between. So you got Birmingham, Luton, Northwest, and you got East. So you got like that bracket in between. So Alhamdulillah, we opened last year, June. And, um, you know, it was, it was a great success. But even in the first day, bro, I'll tell you, like we had prepared for this moment all through COVID, we had set everything up, uh, got everything approved. And then the first day, launch day, electricity goes. <laughs> oh, where? First day, bro. We had like, I don't know, hundreds of people queued up That's and electricity exciting. went. And I thought the electricity went in the whole street, bro. Yeah. Only our shop. No so way. I was thinking, what, what? shop opposite is giving us some nether right yeah, now yeah that's not idea. mashing up our day so i was like i i don't really know what to think because i really, couldn't really do anything to buy it and obviously the queue is still there um and then it started to rain which made it even worse people standing outside raining first day you know Did you get the electricity couldn't really could, yeah after about 40 minutes we managed to get electricity back and you know, alhamdulillah ended up being a good day but it just makes you feel like you know everything you worked for then on the day you'll still have hiccups that you never thought would happen. Yeah. So you got to prepare your mind in a sense where not everyone, not everything's going to be smooth sailing just because you put money into it, you know? And that was one of the things that I learned from traditional businesses that the problems that you have in, let's say, an online business is not the problem you're going to have in a traditional business. The problems that you have in traditional business, you don't have in, again, in a uh, real estate business and yeah. so on and so forth. So different industries have different issues but the key thing to remember is that you want to put yourself in a position where you're the best at problem solving you don't have to be the one solving them yourself but you got yourself put yourself in a position where you understand that something needs to be done and so i need to find the right people to solve it 
you know, if you are that per- that person that doesn't dwell on like, oh, this happened, oh, that crap, but this happened, this happened, and you're that person, okay, let's get this done. We can fix this. We can fix that. If you already put yourself in a position like that where you're, you know, completely optimistic and not pessimistic, you know, I think you, there's a lot more, there's a much higher ceiling with that mindset. Yeah, business always throws issues at you. I think it is how you react to those issues, and some people dwell on the issue longer than it take to fix it. Yeah, know? exactly. You can you can fix the issue and uh, be done with it instead of dwelling on it. So yeah, I totally agree with you there. In terms of uh, the costing for a franchise, just out of curiosity, uh, you mentioned twenty five grand a couple of minutes ago. Is that the initial cost, and then is there uh, like a relayed cost every year as well? It basically with a the franchise, they will charge you like a royalty. They will tell you to have like a certain amount of budget. So they might say quarter of a mil or three hundred k, um, to have like as a budget, um, to be based on your location. So in London, of course, prices are a bit higher compared to Luton. Uh, Luton, I think I know the branch in Luton might have been I think around one hundred and fifty k, two hundred k. That's all in. Yeah, that was all in. But of course, in London, it might be more expensive. Uh, around the the ballpark of around two hundred fifty to three hundred k, but of course, in the end of the day, it's more dependent on. Uh, um, all the training, all the staffing, because we had to actually train our staff with the franchise. So we had to pay for our staff to go and learn from the actual franchise. So they didn't have to make all the burgers. We yeah. had to pay for their staff to come over to our shop for a little while. Yeah. Um, you know, all the, the branding costs, we obviously buy the merch. So all of those things, I think, added up. Um, but of course, franchising, the good thing is that the brand is there. Yeah. You know, so the, the customers knew what Slamberger was. So that, that makes it, you know, kind of like a, a fair ratio when you're yeah. paying all the costs. And in terms of, so it's a quarter of a million pound initial investment, then is there like a, a royalty every year? Did you mention? No, monthly. You no, pay monthly. like a, you'll pay like a percentage. So some businesses will charge 3%, 5%. Um, some businesses are extortionate, you know, they might charge 10%, 15%. Um, you know, s- some of these like uh, big brands one, they might charge around those big numbers. Like yeah. I know, I think I think I know McDonald's do a very high percent. Of course, it's McDonald's, McDonald's but that percentage yeah. would be much more. Should be definitely be a double figure percentage. And you need a huge amount, yeah, to in, yeah. initially invest with them as well. Yeah. Um. So how's that doing for you then? Since last June, yeah, is it okay? Alhamdulillah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. It's uh, it's something that's running now, and um, you know, my younger brother is kind of more of uh, you know, their day to day alongside myself, my auntie, another business partner. Um, all are involved. So you are having to be hands on. It's not something that is sort of hands off. No, it's not hands off for sure. I think that more hands off you leave it. I'm I'm personally not as hands on as uh, let's say my younger brother. Yeah. Um, my auntie who's uh, also a co-owner in there. Um, they're a lot more hands on. Um, she's actually also running our other business, the cafe. Um, so it's you do need someone who's kind of you know going to be there and gonna treat that as their baby in a sense someone has to be there for that because if you don't give it any tlc it's gonna die yeah yeah it's just gonna evaporate then did you open up another franchise as well or no the other one wasn't a franchise the other one was what my auntie had been planning to do for a couple of years yeah Uh, cafe it's called coco london coco london yeah so it's like a cafe there's crepes milkshakes bespoke waffle bites uh very similar to um like a heavenly desserts or Ellen Caf kind of set up. Yeah. They don't really do food, but they just do desserts. But at the same time, it's a uh, small little hut and it's nearby our slam burger too. So yeah, it's, it's uh, decent. And how is that doing as a business? Is that it's new? So again, it has different kind of clientele. Okay. And of course, it doesn't have the branding that Slam Burger has. But the good thing is that we're kind of using slams as well to to help market that. So we'll give like you know flyers of desserts because sandbag doesn't really do desserts so we get flyers of desserts with the slam bag orders when we do deliveries and we, we let them know coca is nearby so they can order uber eats from there as well and any entrepreneurs that are thinking about starting up a business a franchise what kind of advice would you give to them from your experience um again education i think it's key you know trying to learn about the business trying to learn about the franchise trying to learn about your location trying to manage costs Definitely finding the right builders is key. Yeah, you know, I, I really you know, got messed up from my from my builders, and it's strange because the franchise, the franchise, the the main franchise owners, 
you know, they referred the builders. No way. Yeah, so they referred the builders because apparently they done the Leicester store and they just messed they just messed our, our work up, bro. Was it just time scales, uh cost? Time scales, costs, you know, kept growing more than what they had initially asked for. Then the electric stuff was their fault. The reason why electricity went is because the vamps were, were not the amps were, were not entirely right for the appliances that we're using. Right. And so it just bust. It could actually have been a fire. Uh, based yeah. on the electricity uh, fuse box that they had so many issues arose after that like we went into some legal stuff with them based on that so yeah definitely f- getting all that stuff done beforehand but again this is why i tell you investments are not just about investing investments are about you going through the motion of seeing all these failures to understand your next move is going to be bigger and that might be a much greater investment just because of the education you had so you sometimes have to sacrifice. You know, that investment might not go as well, the first one. But the reason why you're doing that is because so you understand how to do the next one. Because you, you can't learn that in the book. You can't learn that from people. People aren't going to tell you, this is why my electricity failed. You know, because I got the wrong builders. That's just experience of what someone's going through. And only, only someone close to you is going to be able to tell you that. But random people, people that randomly see a restaurant, they want to open one. They don't know the dynamics especially for the first time so that's why it's important to get as much done as you can and kind of just pray that it goes as smooth as possible but understand there's going to be a lot of hiccups along the way especially mm-hmm. in the beginning yeah that's very good advice i can imagine it uh, it, it can be quite demanding uh going into the food industry especially up north it's not easy there's so much competition, competition. yeah uh, and there's so many variables that you're trying to manage so yeah no no i totally understand that so you're now what age are you now are you 29 29 or oh, mashallah when did you get married then 22. 22 22 so was that the whilst you were building up the network marketing business you didn't have any franchises at that point did you no 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 um the i was actually in my i was 22 years old i had just i was just resigning from my first company the company was speaking about ecm yeah i was just resigning from there and i remember um you know getting married and i literally moved in with my parents um when, when i got married uh, my, i brought a missus over to my house and i said to myself i need to get myself in a position where i'm where i was because when i first met her i was doing well you know i was doing well but after when i resigned i had to literally start from scratch again as i was telling you so yeah. i had to put myself in a position where now that i'm married I got to get back to how I was because in, when you're in business, sometimes in your mind, you think when you're going through the good times, it's always going to be good or yeah. better. Um, but as things, as I went into the new chapter, I kind of didn't realize that I didn't think really about how it's going to be after mm. I got married. Um, so that's why I really wanted to knuckle down. And that's when I found my next company. Um, which was to do with the trading space when I first got involved in the trading space yeah. with Neto Martin combined it was the first model of its kind where it had trading and it had uh, Neto Martin so I was like I already knew about Neto Martin I just don't know about this trading stuff but I know trading right now is it's, it's, doing, it's, it's doing its thing so I said to myself if I get married now I'm going to have to you know definitely develop myself into a way where I can you know go into this marriage movie but before in the beginning my goal wasn't really to get married very young it, it's something that just came about over time because of the situation with my wife yeah marshall like you, you were really young 22 that is really young yeah um, would you looking back on it uh, recommend for our listeners uh, getting married young or what's your experience been like well obviously 22 every, is really young everyone's different of course I, if you would have told me at 18 am i gonna get married at 22 no would I, I wouldn't even think I would have like a, a proper relationship at 22, let alone yeah. marriage. Um, it was mainly because, alhamdulillah, my, my parents started to practice much more around that time. I remember I was 19, 20. My mom was doing regular umrahs, um, I remember. And I think I think she, did, she, she and my dad had done hajj one of those years, mashallah. And so I said to myself, I was going from like meaningless relationship to meaningless relationship. I was I wasn't really looking for anything anyways. It was only up until when I was about 21, 22 I had met my I had met my missus and she, the the situation with my missus is that um she's from Afghanistan 
So Afghanistan, okay. So she's not from here. She's not from the UK. She actually came here when she was uh, 15 years old. No way. Yeah, so she's born and, born and bred in, in Kabul, Afghanistan. Wow. And when you're, obviously, you know, come back home, when you're in those countries, when you're young and you're less say, for instance, in a, you know, a very difficult environment. So she was one of, I think, 13, 14 cousins wow. and sisters and brothers that lived in the same kind of house area. Uh, and so the granddad of the family will say, you know, once you're young and you're pretty, Just get you're out, you know, you're, you're getting married. And so, but this is what everything is down to, um, you know, everything's already written. Yeah, you know, of course. It's down to Gismet in the end of the day. And so she got married to a guy who had a UK passport. And that was the only way she would come to the UK. So the guy that she got married to at the time when she was 15 years old had a UK passport and he was from Manchester. So he got married to her and he was about 22, 21 and she was 15. Now she wasn't even 16 yet. The couldn't, even bring, couldn't even bring it to the UK. So wow. 10, 16, brought to the UK. Around, I think, nine or 10 months into the marriage, like they go through a lot because she can't even speak the language, you know, and he's from Manchester, literally from Manchester, but he he wants to get married from a girl back home who just have like uh Kids, back uh, home yeah. morals be fertile etc so she couldn't speak english she could speak english still no just fully uh they speak um dari dari okay. farsi 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 yeah, yeah so she was uh going through that and i think after about six months you know she young she gets pregnant once she goes into pregnancy that's when it becomes really difficult she goes through uh, many issues of course she could speak farsi with him but as they go through the issues, long story short, he ends up leaving and she goes into a foster home. So at 16 to 18, if you don't have a home, you're going to go into foster care. So she's pregnant now. Oh, 16. 16 years old. She's in foster care. Doesn't know the language. Going from foster home to foster home, different families. And most of these foster, foster families, most of them, from her words, the experience was didn't let her do anything mainly because one the language barrier second most of them have a lot of kids they do it mostly for the money they get good money uh foster parents so she was in uh different different households she wasn't retreated right until she went into a white family uh in manchester and her foster carer i think her name was jenny really took care of her she had a daughter too who was good friends with uh, my missus and so around 18 19 but she had she had a, of course a little beautiful little girl uh, Zuhal calls her, we call her Millie. Millie okay. So she was um, around, yeah, so she was around two years old, and I think um, my wife tried to go to college, tried to learn the language, went to college, started to study, tried to get a job, you know, do all the normal things. And so when she was studying, learning the language, she was raising a kid at the same time, you know, in college, oh. not learning the language. I met her when she was 22. So I was 22, she was 22. Yeah, okay. So the start of 2022, I remember it was my birthday on the 9th. And it's crazy because the last event I went to for the com company I resigned with, the last event was in Manchester. So I went to Manchester and she was a guest at the event. No way. Yeah. So we just, you know, we just, we just spoke very briefly from there. And obviously I didn't know anything about her at the time. And I just, I just asked her, you know, it's my birthday. I'm here. You know, and she's like, oh, you know what? Let's go out. And so we went to, I remember we went to Nando's. And she's like, because it's my birthday, she'll pay. So we went to Nando's that day. And then it was just like a little friendly lunch, you know, kind of like there was like some kind of connection there. And I went I went home and, you know, I, I had always been in a situation where with girls, I always had in my back of my mind, whoever I get married to, I just don't want the headache of, oh, you don't make time for me. You know, all of those questions that I was getting up to that point, most of the time it was like, you don't make time for me. You don't, you don't care, this and this. And the truth is, I, it's because I didn't want to go into a long-term relationship and I was so focused on the work in hand, the, the business, right? So she was different. She never really, maybe because she had a little one, she didn't want to commit maybe herself or she, she wanted to come to her in comparison to chasing it because maybe she was, I don't know, scared that yeah. the you know, person might not accept her because of the, the little one. And so around, you know, it's just kind of like back and forth for talking for like two months. And then I came back to Manchester, we met up again, and that's when she had told me about the whole story uh, with her little one. 
And so that's when it hit me that, yeah, if I am going to go through this, I can't play games. You know, I've, I've got to do the whole thing. I've got to do the nikah. Because you've got to do it. And See. so I said to myself, maybe I shouldn't rush anything. So I went home, told my sister, older sister, uh, you know, conjured up some strength to, to find more stuff about the little one and I wanted to meet the little one. So I met the little one. The little one's six years old at the time, you know, Millie. So she was too sweet, you know. After a couple of a couple of weeks, a couple of a uh, couple of months, she started calling me dad, you know, because for her she doesn't know any better because she's never had a male figure around her yeah. at all. So before she knew she's six years old, like someone who just wasn't there came back somehow. Um, and so at twenty, yeah, twenty twenty, uh, twenty twenty two years old, I said, you know what? Let me just speak to my my parents. You know, I, I think it's the best way. No point in me. Going back and forth with with her meeting her, it doesn't feel right, you know, because she has a daughter. Um, if I feel like it's right, maybe I should speak to my parents. And she was living in a council house in because uh, after eighteen they give you a council house, so she's living in like one 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 bedroom council house, and it really hit me when um, her handbag got stolen. Like she literally got like oh, two guys came. Took a handbag. It was like a fake Louis Vuitton bag. It wasn't even real. Fake Louis Vuitton bag. Like they, they, they. Uh, I think she was, I remember telling me she was in hospital. I was like, you know what happened? And then she told me, and that's when it really hit me. Like I really got angry. I was like, you know, how can you punch a girl for a handbag to get a phone? Like, like, well, how can it happen? You know, it's, Manchester. I know is notorious for like high crime rate, of course, but. You know, I, I didn't think that would happen to her. You know, is that when she was living in Manchester? That was when she lived in the council. I was like, why would that happen to her? Because she doesn't really go out like that. She's not in the wrong places. But literally, right outside the house, like round on the on that road in the middle of the day. And I said, maybe, maybe I need to take her away from that environment. That's when it got me to, you know, what after only set. That's what like even though it was only seven months, that triggered me, uh, because of what happened. I was like, you know, what? I need to bring her. And I can't just bring her to London. So I got to speak to my parents. So I spoke to my parents, and alhamdulillah, my mum. At the time, she was very, she, because I'm my oldest son, she'll probably say this as well, like, I'm, I've been more closer to her than my other brother and sisters. Yeah. For her, it was like, I'm going to lose my only son, because mothers always think that when you're getting married, you're going to have now, there's going to be some kind of like, uh, you, she, he's going to have another woman in his life as well now, apart yeah. from, of course, myself. So... She wasn't really open to it when I gave her the whole story. But then when she started to digest it, she started to understand it Islamically of what I'm about to do and if, you, if you're already ready for it. And so we started to have these conversations back and forth. And I said, you know what? She said, you know what, Zane? This is the best thing you're going to do. Even the, how, how much success you've had, whatever you've done so far, it's nothing compared to what you're about to do. So... Uh, yeah, we just kind of just um, went through with it, brought it to the family. Luckily, she was, uh, Mosul's always been very, very like, you know, because she's from back home. She's quiet, um, skin type. Um, so she fit, fit right into the family, didn't speak too much. Um, she know, also knows my language, you know, she knows Urdu quite a bit. Because yeah. normally that's how it works with the, uh, they watch a lot of Bollywood movies and stuff. <laughs> um so yeah, it, it kind of she kind of just fit into the fit into the mold, and you know Millie came over. Everyone loved Millie, and yeah, one thing led to another. And then after we had a nikah at twenty two, she moved in with me. But then of course, it got to a stage where it was me, my brother, my sister, my mum, my dad, and Millie, six of us in a three bedroom house. Wow. So now it's like okay, you know we need to, we need to think about moving, especially for Millie's sake, you know, because she's a. Uh, She's young. She's going to grow older now. She's a girl. She needs her own room. So I was like, you know what? I need to start looking for an apartment. And I looked for an apartment. I found an apartment nearby, only five minutes from my mom's place. And I remember the apartment. I remember the time cost around £2,000 a month. Two-bed apartment. And it wasn't even like too luxury. But at the same time, I said to myself, you know, if I'm going to pay for this, I need to make sure I'm on my game. I'm really doing the business. Um, and so I joined a new company, and I said to myself, if I can put myself in a position in this company where I'm, you know, I know my rent's covered, I know my lifestyle's covered, I can build myself up, up from there. But alhamdulillah, things just started to escalate on a on a whole new level. And I remember my my mom saying to me, Zen, you didn't even have to try hard because the moment you got married, it was always going to happen. Because the blessings came with 
uh, with the wife. You know, that's that's also something that someone else told me is that uh, once you bring a woman into your household, um, blessings come with it, or the opposite. You know, there might be disasters that come with it. <laughs> if you get married to the wrong one, yeah. Exactly. You yeah. Know, there's also a talk. I remember listening to a talk online, and the guy was like. The guy came on stage with like two kids. It was like Zark and Nike um, talk crossfire. I, I, I love listening to the debates. Okay. So the guy comes in with two kids. The guy asked uh, Zark and Nike, he said, brother, I have two kids. They don't listen to me, this and that. You know, 10 years old. I just tell them what to do, but they don't listen. You know, when should I have educated them? When should I have given them some kind of that be at? You know, when could I have done that? He said, the moment you chose your wife. Because your, your children are going to be a representation more of your mum of of the mother in comparison to the father because the father is most likely not going to be there as much as the mother um he's going to be working or, or naturally kids have a connection more towards the mother especially in the beginning so i i already i thought about that when, when i was um with my missus and so when she, when i when the blessings came i understood it was a lot to do with uh my marriage so 23 we had the we had the kind of like the reception type wedding. I don't know if you've seen it on YouTube. I think I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Seen. I think I watched one where, I'm I'm sure it was was it you where you're on top somewhere. I yeah, that was the wedding. Was that the yeah, wedding? Two yeah. different parts of it. Yeah, yeah. So it's there's... like you're you're on a balcony. Kind yeah, yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had like all that rehearsed from before. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's good. There was a good dancer on there. I can't remember. It was he like a, he was probably one of your friends or something. Yeah, he's my best friend. Yeah, it's a good dancer. Right? A good dancer. Like, yeah, no. he used to compete like in school days. Is he? Yeah, he's a, he's got some moves. A big shout out to him. Yeah, MJ. So a uh, big shout out to MJ. So I've got a few questions just to stop you on there because that's fascinating. Mashallah. Firstly, a huge props to you. It's very important that we talk about this on the podcast because you, you married someone. There's a in within our culture, you're as you probably are aware of. There's always a stigma for people that are divorced. You know, they're frowned upon or yeah. it's looked down upon, and it's a topic that isn't really discussed as much. So, for you to get married to somebody that was divorced and not really judge her, what was your mindset in thinking like you didn't judge her at all? Yeah, man, I I never really judge her at all because in the end of the day, there could have been many. Look, she could have been lying all I knew you know she could have cooked up a story but for some reason I felt like there was there was a good heart somewhere that that uh, you know within within her I could I could feel the energy um, and so I, I said to myself you know what if I prejudge her or I base it on the fact that she's married before you know and you know with all due humility it wasn't a situation where I had to get married like I was 22 years old yeah and there was many options on the table I could have stayed single I could have got married later you know, I, there was many, many options. It wasn't like I was later down the line and, you know, she was there and I'm in my mid-30s and stuff and she's young and she's married before. It was a situation where we were both the same age and we were both young and she had a kid. So it's like, oh, well, I'm about to be a dad, like, ready, straight away, 22, boom, a six-year-old. So I'm like, you know, there's people at my age of 22 with six-year-old sisters, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's true. And I'm going to have a daughter at that point. I took it in, in, in a sense where, you know what, I felt like Allah is telling me you can go into these meaningless relationships and you can keep doing this 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 nonsense or you can take care of a good woman and you can take on this responsibility. And it was like if I didn't do it, I was doing something wrong. Even though I wasn't. Like if I didn't do it, like it is what it is. Like I just you know, I just didn't do it. Just something but if I did it, I felt like it was something that I was only doing for the for the sake of Allah and for, for my own happiness. And everything. I I knew that when I got married, I was going to be in a situation where I'm not going to have the same kind of headache that I had before when it came to um, yeah relationships. It was difficult. Life, yeah. yeah. For the listeners, uh, what kind of advice would you give to people that are maybe going through a divorce? Maybe people that are feeling like they're getting judged because they're divorced. I can tell you, look, when it comes down to your relationships, feelings don't lie, you know. And um, one of the things that I've realized is that if you have a genuine feeling for the for the individual, there will be always be a way to work it out. You know, always. Um, you know, most of the most of the divorces that do happen happen because of finances. And so, I've always said to myself. Whether, it's, whether you're financially fit or not, or whether you're going through some issues or not, uh, whether you're young or not, 
ask yourself the question, if you are financially stable, would you want to still be with the same partner? Or if you're financially unstable, would you want to stay with the same partner? Me, myself, if I was financially unstable, I would still want to stay with the same partner. If I was financially wealthy, I would still want to spend it on the same partner. If the question arises on, let's say, for instance, not finances and, uh, I don't know, uh, headache. Let's say your spouse is someone or your partner is someone who, you know, argues a lot, for instance. Would you rather argue with your spouse or argue with someone else who's not your spouse? Does that make sense? So yeah. you're going to argue with your spouse in the, the day or partner in the, the day. Yeah. You're always going to have arguments. Me, I would rather argue with my spouse in comparison to argue with someone who's not my spouse. So again, it's, it's all about pros and cons. Whenever someone thinks about divorce, you think about not being with that person. For me, it just wasn't worth it. Um, at the time, I felt like I made, I made the right choice. And all of these things are done by instinct. Again, no one can teach you on it. So inshallah, uh, Allah blesses our, our, our marriages uh, for the long term. Um, but it's something that, of course, is already written and we just kind of have to go with the flow. Inshallah, I know. Yeah. Huge props to you for then the other side of it, which is getting married to somebody and taking care of a child that's not yours because that is a big responsibility, yeah. sort of taking care of somebody that's not your child. Yeah. And what was your thinking around that time? Because you're 22, you're young, you're now going to become a father to a to a child what was your thinking around that did you have second thoughts or yeah I, I, I knew that she wasn't gonna know about stepfather stuff from that from that young I knew she was only gonna know me as dad yeah until very later on when she started to understand things but she was always such a easy child to deal with like very very like such a good reader like literally all she done was read books you give her two books she'll have the best day um so alhamdulillah she would have she'll go to school um Musa will take her to a little uh quran lesson after so when i brought her to to my to london i you know i got her into i got her into the school that where i used to go madresa they have they had a, a kid's school like a private school so the islamic schools they don't teach you the same things as they would in a grammar school uh the education is not of the same quality but of course they do punctuality in 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 in, in quran in salah they pray all the salahs in school so i wanted to have to get that discipline more than anything else of course the education is fine but she was sharp as it is i was like primary school is not too much about the education that comes in high school so I was like, if i can get into a, a islamic pri primary school maybe that can be something that she can take on forward like the hijab etc so Alhamdulillah, I, I put her in there. You know, even though it was more expensive, of course, than, you know, a grammar school is free. But these are the kind of sacrifices that I wanted to make from the beginning. And again, uh, Allah gives you the blessings and these are the kind of things you want to you wanna spend it on. And so, yeah, that was the that was the plan with Millie. And now she's, uh, she's going to be 15, 14, 15. Um, she sure. goes to high school now. Um, very good school. Very good school. One of the best, one of the best in North London. Um, and she's doing very well as well with her, with her, with her academics. Mashallah, I fully rate that to be fair. So that's huge respect to you for that, mashallah. That's really, really inspirational. And, it, and it, it's a good positive message to put out there to people that are maybe struggling or people that feel like they've got kids and they won't be able to find the right partner that it doesn't matter what your situation is, the right person will come along and, uh, and uh, take care of you, so to speak. Um, so I love that, mashallah. Are you healthy vibes, Zain? No, no, no. <laughs> I was going to say, you said personal <laughs> training. Dad bod, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm doing right now, man. Hey. So you probably just have to adjust your mic a little bit. Just Rodisa. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. Okay, huh? So I can see that Dean has played quite an important role in your life. Is that the case? Uh, yeah, alhamdulillah, I've, I've lived in a household where Islam has always been, um, you know, the the major major factor within the household. You know, we grew up uh, going to the mosque, you know, learning things about Islam all the way through. Even even today we have, uh, you know, family Quran classes. We learn about the knowledge. Um, of course, there is, this is, there is still a 
feeling inside me that I can do more because the time that I've spent in business, time that I've spent chasing uh, worldly affairs has been something that maybe if I was to, you know, I don't know, later on, maybe the, I think the longer I, I live, uh, I, I, I stand to think about the fact that I've spent maybe too much time focused on that. But again, um, inshallah, it's something I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rectify and spend a little bit more time doing uh, the things that are much more important. Mashallah. And I had a couple of questions uh, regarding what you said previously, which was uh, one of them is the Pakistani culture and the Afghan culture. I find that quite interesting. Yeah. What would you say is the main differences between the cultures and your marriage? Have you noticed any sort of uh, challenges or is it quite easy and are they very similar? Uh, they're not. They, they, they're similar and not similar at the same time. Um, I feel like, um, you know, recently it's become a little bit worse with what's happened there. But um, within my personal case, it was very smooth because um, my wife's parents were so cool. You know, they're very, very humble. Um, you know, you know, from very, very um, lower class background from back home. So it was very easy to speak to them, you know, to, to, let, to let them know what's happening. Uh, and of course, my missus was here alone. So she has no family, she has one auntie. Um, who lives nearby us who's also so nice and so yeah it wasn't too bad for us in in terms of that barrier um i know it's it's different for different people um but in my situation is much easier i remember when we first got married there was a lot of questions regarding that you know how how did you accept a pakistani family and vice versa yeah but in the end of the day every situation is different you know some cultures are like you know we're only going to get married to pakistani family you know, if you're yeah. Pakistani, and some some families are like, oh, if you bring a, you know, you know, if you bring a black girl home, or if you bring a white girl home, even if she's Muslim, even if she's a Reva, we're not going to understand it in our culture. And so, this is the kind of um, ideology that's backwards and is un-Islamic. I, for me, I feel like right now, you need to look look at things in a in a perspective that one brings the person happiness optimally, like literally long term the person is going to be like you know i'm going to be happy with this person and of course looking at all the factors around it as long as uh the uh it's a muslim family and if you're muslim if that's what you believe in it doesn't matter what race um as long as the person is going to be happy so you know even me for instance i like i have a son now rayan he's four years old um if you know one day down the line he says look you know i want to get married to this egyptian girl for instance and she's muslim I'm not going to say, oh, because she doesn't know Urdu, or she doesn't know Punjabi, or she doesn't know uh, the way our culture is, she doesn't eat our food, I'm not going to marry her, or we're not going to, we're not going to get, on, get along with the family. At the end of the day, that's all something that's to, to please others. Because most of the families, what they think is that if they bring a, a person home who's from an outside culture, outside family, they have to do it, they're explaining to others. Yeah. Oh, you know, we, we, you know he got married to uh, a Jamaican girl that's Muslim. <laughs> You know, and then the person be like, "Oh wow, a Jamaican girl!" <laughs> yeah, no Telling way. Asian dad is that. Is uh, you not know Asian. what I'm saying? So it's like that kind of um, ideology. I think is 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 what's really setting us back as Asians. You know? Yeah, I think within the Pakistani culture is a, a taboo subject. Oh. Interracial marriages, even when you just talk Pakistani, it then dives in a little deeper into caste. Yeah. So even you can marry a Pakistani girl, Shia. but she's not from a certain caste, the Shia Sunni side of things as well, and then. Yeah within the Pakistani culture, the whole caste system as well. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, again, it's something that I didn't deal with, really, myself. Um, alhamdulillah, it was for me and even my parents. We, like, we never ask, you know, if someone is, is Shia Sunni. We say, are you Muslim? And in the end of the day, that's what counts. All of the Sunni Shia came after Islam. So I believe everything regarding caste and these issues, families that speak about it within the household from the very beginning is what determines the culture later on so so me and my my wife not speaking about it is because our parents never speak about it and that would mean that my son and my daughter won't speak about it and vice versa if someone that does speak about it then again it'll be something that has a ripple effect where if shias don't want to get married to sunnis is because the shia household knows a hey, sunni don't even speak to him because they've been brought up that way your environment is very powerful. Someone someone grows up in a Christian environment, they're going to be Christian. Someone grows up in a Judaism environment, they're going to be Jew. Ju- you know, they're going to be Jewish. So it's not it's not about you know what you say. It's the environment you build around you know your children. That's why it's so important to have you know, uh, for example, 
you know the right kind of uh, culture the right kind of language the the right kind of videos that your kids watch you know the right kind of uh, messages on the wall you know these are the kind of things that are so so important i believe more now than ever especially with what's happening in the uk you know with all this uh, schooling it's the way the system is run here with all the you know the lgbt stuff yeah. you know you got you you create that environment for your for your children you know you put them in an environment where they can learn about that then it's your fault yeah you know that's what you gotta be careful of that makes total sense there are a lot of challenges in the uk you mentioned something a little bit earlier where you went through a difficult period uh, so once you left the first network marketing firm and uh, that income wasn't coming in you then got married your you and your missus moved in and you've got a full family brother sister mom dad everyone living in one household so what was your experience like at that point then when you're moving your missus into your family home what kind of challenges did you have to deal with i know there's a lot of people have perceptions when it comes to the challenges around living in a family home as a married couple where you need your privacy as well what's your thoughts on that and your experience on that yeah of course you know with uh with family there's always going to be sometimes you know back and forth and that's like in every household um but with me um within my family it was mainly around the subject of the little one you know i wanted to make sure that she's comfortable um, that she has her own room, etc. I didn't want to make anyone else uncomfortable as well in terms of telling my sister that she has to share a room with a six-year-old, and she was older than me as well, or my younger brother, and of course he's a boy. So I had to, it was more like a necessity in my scenario. It wasn't just me and my wife; it was also me, my wife, and the little one. So yeah. it was more, you know, very important that I, I had done that. But of course, there's some situation where it's not it's not the case, and you go through those issues. For me, the most important thing is patience. You know, patience for me is something that, you know, I, I believe is is key to every single relationship, especially that mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, father-in-law, son-in-law relationship is patience. The, the more patient you are with, with the situations you're going through, the more you end up being closer. And when you become closer, the things that were once big issues become minor issues. Um, I'll give you an example. I play league cricket right now. When I first got into the team, the skipper was a very, like, he's very hard on me because I was the new guy, you know, the newbie that was coming in. Every time I would make a mistake, he would get a lot more agitated because I'm not one of the regulars. I'm not one of the favorites. And so now I've been in that team for about three, four years. It's not the case no more. He's not as hard on me. He's seen me as one of the regulars. He's seen me as one of the senior bodies. He's seen me based on my performances that I'm, one of the guys now so when a newbie comes in he might be more agitated towards them and he's now forgotten about the agitation towards me because he knows what i bring to the table for the past three four years if i drop a catch or if i do something wrong he knows that's not the natural me i know i can still make mistakes i can still do the same mistakes i was making in my first year so the thing about being and going into a new, new household as a as a son-in-law as a daughter-in-law is just patience you will you will eventually win the family over now that doesn't mean that you you know uh, massage their feet every day <laughs> no, it's mainly about you just doing the things that you've done but just doing it in a way where you understand the long-term benefits in comparison to oh you know i want things to be you know nice and rosy right now when it's not really the case all the time sometimes you have to kind of earn your stripes and you know in the end of the day things are different now you know and some people can adapt to that and some people can't so would you recommend from your experience the missus moving in with your family for a yeah. certain period of time yeah yeah of course yeah. I, look if you if you if you go into a marriage a man a man goes into a marriage the woman naturally coming over if if the woman understands the man it will be because she understands the family behind the man because the man is sculpted through the family if he if she can get into a stage where she's very close to the mum her relationship automatically with the husband is super strong super strong so that's why it's also important first game with the family understand that the way towards a stronger relationship is a stronger unity the more you're segregated the more chance of loss there's been situations where I'm sure 
in marriages where things have gone bad, the families end up stepping in and solving it for the couple. And that wouldn't happen if the families are segregated from the couple. If they go through some issues, it's just them to deal with it. So where the families are strong, you know, the families might educate the kids and, hey, you know, you were wrong or you were right, etc. And so that's super important, I think, you know, going into the house. And the same thing with the, with the guys where well, he, of course, has to be respectful to the, to the wife's parents. I know a lot in a lot of people in Asian families and households right now, they don't really care for the wife's parents sometimes yeah. because they be like, oh, you know, she's living in my house. I ain't really got to do much there. But again, I feel like it's, it still takes two. Um, you know, you, you don't have to be as engaging, of course, if you don't live there. But again, the message here and there goes a long way. It builds a rapport again and builds a stronger relationship. That's a strong message, yeah. The man being able to take care of the missus' in-laws, build that relationship just as much as the missus comes in and uh, builds those bond with your families. It's two families merging together mm -hmm. and it works both ways. I like that. That's a positive message to be putting out there. Um, so... Moving on from that uh, little uh, topic that we've done, really good advice. Thank you very much for that. What would you say has been the lowest point in your life? The first, the first challenge was uh, when I first, you know, like I was telling you in high school when I got kicked out. You know, yeah. like when I was at home for three months, I really thought like, man, I'm, I'm in a big problem here. Like I don't know where my life is going. Like, Were you quite a naughty kid then, naturally? Or? I wasn't. I wasn't naughty per se. I wasn't like um, trying to start fights or anything. Every time something happened I just you know it wouldn't even be like I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time it was more about I made the wrong choices but it wasn't me you know it wasn't the real me I was it was more by maybe influence or the fact that you know I put myself in a position where I made the wrong choices but I knew it wasn't me like I knew I was better than that so I knew when I went into my to my school I was gonna fix up and do better however um, recently last year I went through a really strange phase, like I really went to a struggling phase. Um, when I resigned from my last company, just mentally, um, the pressure it took out of my mind because I was actually gonna be in a situation where, I, when you're, whenever you're in a transitional phase in business, it's always stress -worthy, stressful. But at the same time, while you're going through that and you're confused about what it is you should do, because when it comes to projects in business, especially in online business, you want to put out something that you know is you're going to be able to give your full-time attention to and it can last long term. You don't just want to do things for the sake of doing it. So I was in such a confused time where I didn't know what I should do and how I should do it. So alhamdulillah, everything, everything becomes easier as time goes on. Again, patience is a big, big importance uh, when it comes to making decisions. Of course, one of the things that I, I did, uh, back in the days even do it now uh is is the kata. you know always praying and finding out if something is right for me i believe in that fully um and so when i did that to start this project that i'm in right now you know i, I felt good and alhamdulillah it's been going well. i've been nearly a year now here it's been going smooth um but yeah i think the hardest moments for me have been when i myself don't know where I'm going, when there's lack of purpose, when there's, when there's clear direction of where you're going, it doesn't matter whether you're broke, and you, if your goal is, is Dean, for instance, and you want to be spiritually rich, it doesn't matter if you're broke, because your purpose is not finances, your purpose is the richness of Dean, for instance, if your purpose is education, it doesn't matter if you're making money or not, because your purpose is to learn education. For example, uni students don't really care about having thousands of, of pounds to go on, uh, uh, you know, spend on a, on a holiday because they understand that this that's going to happen later. Yeah. And again, it's people that are chasing finances, they might not care about the fact of um, education maybe as much. They'll be like, oh, maybe I don't have to learn this much right now. Maybe I can just go with what I know and just try and, you know, put all my action in to make sure I make enough money. See... It all comes down to perspective in the end of the day. When you have the certain kind of perspective, it goes the way you want it to go based on how you're looking at it. Um, and that's where the fam famous quote came in. If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so, yeah, I think perspective is a, is a big part. So for me, that patience and having that perspective on what I want, that's the best stress reliever for me. Every time someone's going through an issue, I just tell them, listen, 
Just find your purpose. Find out what it is you want to do. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be small. It just has to be true. And what drives you right now then? Looking at your journey in your younger years, it was uh, to sort of achieve success, Probably. help your mom and dad out. I think I saw a video where you purchased, uh, was it a, a Merc for your mom or dad? So you were trying to build that financial stability and look after your parents. What's driving you now that you've achieved success? To be honest, I'll be honest with you, uh, as if I, I feel like I haven't really achieved it yet. Like I, I feel like I'm still very far away from success because success is whatever you define it to subjective, be subjective yeah yeah it's very subjective so for me i'm i'm still behind on 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 many of the subjects that i want to excel in i'm still behind in business i'm still behind on dean i'm still behind on 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 being the best dad i can be the best friend and so on so i'm still chasing an element of success in all areas um but the point is to put myself in positions where i can learn as much as i can to 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 elevate and excel so yeah that's that's what i'm trying to do right now you just uh, spoke about being the best dad there possible. A lot of people say when you become a father, it completely changes you and it's a surreal feeling. W what kind of uh, experience have you had there? Is it completely surreal? Does it change you as a person, the way you think, the way you act? Everything. Yeah, everything. I think being a dad, you, you know, when you become a father, I think you have an instant sense of maturity. Like, those things that might have interested you before, they don't as much because you think to yourself now as a father, you want your son or your daughter to experience those levels of excitement they used to. So for example, even small things like video games, like I still love video games, but I love to have my son playing video games today. Like when he's on his iPad and stuff and he's playing this racing game, like I love for him to, to enjoy that because I had already enjoyed it and I know how it feels. So those are the kind of things that I think are Again, you can't really tell someone they go experiencing themselves. So, if someone is young and they're Muslim, they shouldn't think about, oh, let me get the finances right before I get married. Let me get the finances right before I have kids. Just do it, and the blessings come with it. You know, there's 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 friends that I know that have seven, eight kids, and you say to, oh man, like I have I have two or three, like that's that's liability is enough. But everything is in accordance and it comes with in its with its purpose. So for example, he said to me, Well, the things that you would do for the two free kids that you have, when I have eight kids, the newest kid that's born, the things that my oldest has done is teaching the little one. So the little one doesn't have to get taught by us. We don't even spend time with it. The kids spend time with them and they learn through the other kids. So it's on, it's like on autopilot really. Yeah. Um and these are the kind of things that I wouldn't know because, you know, where would I have seen that? I would have to experience it. But again, I've prejudged it based on my two kids. And I've said, oh, that must be much more expensive. When really, truly, it's kind of the same. You're just kind of extending that leverage anyway. So it's less time, less, actually less money for you because more of what's around gets shared out. And so you don't have to spend as much time on it. And uh, in terms of uh, your future, uh, what are the plans for yourself? What are you wanting to do for the future? Well, inshallah, in the future, I would definitely, um, I definitely haven't a chance to go to to Hajj pilgrimage yet. Inshallah, very very soon is my plan um, with my wife and uh, to to go to to go to Hajj. Alhamdulillah, I've done a couple of Umrahs. Alhamdulillah. Um, but that's the next step, and also to expand on a few of the businesses expand and help our, our company grow to uh, 1 million customers right now we've just started about 15,000 customers right now to help the company keep growing to help the company elevate help teach people about how they can get involved in in business and of course at the same time uh, while still building the right brand you know the right kind of person so people can look at and, and hopefully one day inspire to be like and for listeners that are listening that are wanting to start up businesses from your experience, you've been around a lot of people, you've learned a lot yourself over the years. What kind of advice would you give to people? Just do it. You know, um, when it comes to business, again, what we've spoken about today is you can never learn this via theory. It's like driving a car. You know, you can imagine someone trying to drive a car via theory, it just wouldn't work. So business is all about risk and 
anything worth having is gonna have some risk to it. Um, and I know that's a cliche thing to say, but naturally what you have to think about is that most people, they feel like they're naturally gonna be comfortable doing something that's not uncomfortable, if that makes sense. If they go into business, it's gonna be uncomfortable. So it's like, you know what, forget the, forget the business stuff. I'll just stick to uh, what I know. It's a bit like TikTok. We're just speaking about TikTok right now. I've never been, like I had not jumped on TikTok because I just thought TikTok is more like uh, just videos and and creating content, maybe selling products on there or like uh, maybe more for girls to do all their makeup stuff, you know, make them videos and stuff. Like like I I saw the stuff my missus was doing and I was like, I can never do that. That's not a guy's thing to do. Um, and that kind of audience, but when I saw the, the 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 reach and the kind of education when I jumped on it a couple of months ago, I was like, "Well, wow, this is this is quite cool." But I prejudged it because I was comfortable using Instagram. I was comfortable in my in that space of already having that page, and even though it wasn't it wasn't hard to open up an app, log in, and post the videos. Like it didn't yeah. take that long, but it's the actual comfortability of your, of your mindset that once you're in something, you feel like that's the bubble to be in. Yeah. Whereas it doesn't cost anything normally to just expand your mind and understand there is there is another world out there. And in most cases, it can be risk-friendly. Like online businesses, they can be done outside of whether you're doing education, whether you're doing, outside, uh, whether you're doing a, a job, or whether you're doing a, a business yourself. You know, it's all outside of it. So it's, again, it's something that's risk-friendly. Yeah. No, so, I, I agree with that. I think I've prejudged TikTok as well. Uh, I used to just think it when I was looking at people dancing, kids, all the cringy kind of. Yeah, for yeah, me, it's cringy. cringy I can't yeah, judge. Yeah. Uh, other people might not find it cringy, but you know, like the dances and for all sure. the rest of it. I personally found it cringy. But when you look into it and you start to get the reach, and then I've got suit sales from there, business ventures. I've met up with people through there. You start to see, wow, okay. This you podcast, right? This podcast right here. And it just goes to show the power of social media and having that growth mindset and an open mind more than anything. Not just judging something based on what you can see and actually opening up the lenses and, and being more open-minded. So I completely agree with you there. That's powerful advice to end the podcast on. Any famous quotes or, or books or anything? Because I know you're, you've you probably read a fair few books. Um, there's a book that I read um, back in 2014. It's one of my favorite books. Of course, there's many, many great, great books to read from. There's Think and Grow Rich, uh, Napoleon Hill. Yeah. There's uh, How to uh, How to Win and Influence Friends. There's uh, I like that book. You know, I, there's uh, another book, um, Secrets of a Millionaire Mind, Harvey Eck, which is a very good book as well. Um, it teaches you about the in, inner space, which is very important because naturally people feel like the money is going to come from outside the yeah. outside, but it really comes from the inner world. Um, but there's one book called Compound Effect, and it's not the most popular book, but it was actually the author came to a, uh, came on stage for a training where I actually heard him speak about the book. But if you read the book and you understand it, everything you do in life is a result of compound. If it's gonna be successful, if it's gonna be something that's gonna have some kind of good come out of it, it's gonna be a little of a lot, or a lot of a little. It's not gonna be, oh, let me do something for a little while, and then stop, and then do something for a little while, and then stop, and it's gonna become something good. Everything will require a compound effect to it. And so that book was really something that helped me change a lot of things that helped, it helped me actually, there's a part in there about saving money. Because in business, they naturally tell you, don't save money. Yeah. You know, invest money, invest money. But sometimes the best investment is no investment. And saving money can actually feel like an extra income. In this book, the, the author, Darren Hardy, he speaks about every time you spend something, write it down. Like every time. If you buy a, a lollipop for your kid, write it down. If you buy a McDonald's, write it down. If you buy some trainers, designer shoes, a car, write it all down. Every single day, write it down. After the month, you wrote down everything that you spent, every single pen, every single day. You will see what kind of waste of money you've done. And at the end of the month, psychologically, you'll feel so bad about spending that thousand or spending that two thousand, whatever it is, on nonsense. Things that you could have called home and be like, you know, is there anything at home cooked instead of me getting food from outside? So psychologically, after that, you know what happens? When you go to stop at McDonald's, you just drive past it because you feel like, you know, if I buy something at McDonald's, I'm gonna have to write it down. Yeah. So psychologically, what happens is that you stop spending unnecessary money. 
And the compound effect of that is that you start saving that four, five hundred pounds that you would normally have. That four, five hundred pounds doesn't add up to much. You might think at that month, but you count that for the year. Exactly. That's six k. Ten years, sixty k. Twenty years, one hundred twenty k. And there's a, the the st- the theory behind that was a guy was complaining after his forty years of working. He said, "I have no money saved." The author asked him, "What did you spend money on daily?" He said, "I bought a coffee every morning." Yeah. How much was the coffee? Three dollars seventy-five. I work nine to five. Two point four billion people drink coffee every day. Imagine that. That's more than water and more than coke. So the most amount of people that drink something every day is coffee. So coffee, three dollars seventy-five. Starbucks coffee. For forty years of work, it would have totaled for him if he just never drank coffee. That's it. That's all he had to do. Stop coffee. He could have drank coffee, but maybe not that one. Maybe not three dollars seventy-five. Make, dro- make it at home. But because he had spent that money, fifty-five k is what he would have had after retirement. Fifty thousand, fifty-five thousand pounds of coffee. Fifty-five thousand dollars. He could have bought a brand new Mercedes. Could have put, you know, down payment on a house. So again, these are the small compound effects. And there's many stories like there's a, a thing about a, a woman trying to lose weight. She was having cereal every day. A cereal compounding effect had the result of her not losing as much weight if she just cut out a cereal she would have had a massive caloric deficit so again these are the kind of things that i think once you once you read enough books you don't have to read the whole book just a few few chapters just sticks and then that will change the course of your how you live your life makes sense uh, it's like one of my apps now that's just coming up a habit app it's all building those little habits daily that then compound and you know, make an impact in months and, and years to come. There you go. Um, so, yeah, I agree with that. Totally, that's a good way to end the podcast. Uh, Zain, thank you very much for coming down. Is there anything you want to say to the listeners before you go? Where can they oh, reach it's you? A, it's, a, it's a privilege, first and foremost, for uh, to be on here. You know, it's a, it's a great show, and I'm uh, excited to, to be here, first and foremost. And, of course, um, yeah, you can catch me on Instagram. You know, my name is Zain Khan with a four instead of the A at the end. Yeah. Um. So and also on TikTok now with two ends at the end. I'm sure I will probably link it onto the onto, I'll the, onto the podcast. Put it onto the description. Zane travelled all the way from London to up north, which is sort of is it a four hour commute? A three and a half hours. Three uh, three and a half four hour commute. So and this is an exclusive. This is the first time Zane's come on and done a full podcast like this and shared some of the stuff that you've shared from start to finish. So. Uh, if you guys want to see any more exclusives like we're doing back-to-back exclusives be sure to like subscribe and uh, comment down below any other any other feedback just drop a comment and we'll uh, we'll get in touch with you guys till the next episode thank you very much thank you guys